Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place we crunch the political issues and cut through the politician's spin. We have a first for the show today. Two brilliant historians on the show this week. First, I'll talk with Paul Moon about the history of the Treaty of Waitangi, five myths about the treaty, and what he thinks is a pathway forward for the nation. Then I'll catch up with Michael Bassett to revisit his view of the last government and to outline some of the challenges the new government led by Christopher Luxon faces. Of course, we'll have the mailbag to get your feedback. And naturally, we'll close out the show with Cam's buddies, and see what they think about the collapse of News Hub and the general state of the media in New Zealand. Don't forget to send comments to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. On Monday this week, a dud judge slapped the man who bashed an elderly grandmother at the Posey Parker debacle in Auckland with a very well-soaked and extremely wet bus ticket discharging him without conviction. Worse, the judge has prevented anyone from finding out who this violent bully is, preferring to listen to a woke lawyer and a set of pathetic excuses. The woman, the victim here, received a broken eye socket for daring to want to hear a woman speak. And on that day, a bunch of men were violent and attacked women for wanting to hear a speech. It's as simple as that. And the penalty of a terrible assault was less than nothing. The victim is now victimised again, and because, it seems, the judiciary supports violent misogynists. Of course, the Green Party had several MPs in attendance that were there as women were being silenced. Which is ironic, because the guy who assaulted James Shaw as he walked through the Botanic Gardens in Wellington on his way to work was prosecuted and sentenced to nine months imprisonment for the same offence except in this case it was a man assaulting a man. In the recent case, it was a man assaulting a woman. There's actually a specific law of man assaults woman, but it wasn't used. This is an absolute travesty of a judgment, and one that should not and cannot stand. The message this judge has sent is just as appalling as the excuses handed out by the man's equally woke lawyer. The lawyer claims that this man was just caught up in the frenzy of the situation. A frenzy, I might add, was caused by a bunch of men seeking to silence a woman, aided and abetted by Green Party MPs, 
and police who stood back and watched. If they'd just let Posey Parker speak, then there would have been no attacks, no assaults, and no headlines. And that's where the media come in. Just like Waitangi Day this year, it was the media egging on people towards violence so they could get their headlines and their videos and their sound bites. The judge, however, has signaled that assaulting women is okay with him, that if you have a handy and pathetic excuse, like being neurodiverse, then the judiciary will allow you to assault women. That's an insult to the victim, to women, and to neurodiverse people. I know plenty of people on the autism spectrum, and none of them violently assault people, and none would use it as an excuse for their poor behaviour either. Thankfully, the Free Speech Union is going to appeal the name suppression element of the sentence. This was a sad day for New Zealand justice system, and everyone from the police who failed to control the crowd to the Green Party for aiding and abetting the crowd, to the lawyer who dreamed up pathetic excuses, and of course a dud judge who thinks victims' rights can be trumped by the rights of a violent offender. They let the general public down, and most importantly the victim of this appalling violence. And then we hear Transport Minister Simeon Brown saying on Tuesday that his plans to build new roads means that fines could double. Sure, Simeon. Hit the motorist to make more coin, but ignore the violent granny basher and the weak sentencing from a dud judge with a history of soft sentencing. Back in 2020, a man who masturbated in front of a 10-year-old boy at Auckland's West Wave Pools was discharged without conviction, and the 25-year-old was also granted permanent name suppression. The judge was Judge Kevin Glubb, the same judge who just let a man who assaulted a woman get off scot free and the excuse by the man who was indecent while watching a child get changed well he was let off in part because he claimed he was jet lagged the problem in our justice system is not the penalties it is weak judges perhaps the new justice minister judith collins might like to crush a few judges careers so they get the message that it is unacceptable behavior from a member of the judiciary Historian Paul Moon is on the crunch next up. He's forgotten more than most people know about New Zealand history. And after the debacles around Waitangi Day and the attacks on David Seymour's Treaty Principles Bill, I thought it might be a good idea to get Paul on to discuss the history of the treaty. Five myths about the treaty and what it is in terms of its standing constitutionally. Paul is on the line now. Welcome to the crunch, Paul. Good morning. I was reading an article that you wrote uh, a few, uh, this year it was, about Waitangi Day, the five myths and misconceptions that confuse the treaty debate. It was published on the Conversation website. And I read through that and I thought, I'm still confused. So I was wondering if you can help me. <laughs> you want me to write another article? No, not a problem, not a problem. No. No, let's just talk about this. You've made five points about myths and misconceptions that confuse the treaty debate. Mm -hmm. All right. The first one is the two versions. There's yeah. actually more than two versions, isn't there? Well, there's an English version to start off with, which is yeah. the, the, the based on, on the instructions that Hobson got from London. And that was produced by Hobson and Busby and a few others. Yeah. But mainly by those two. That was then translated into Te Reo by Henry Williams, and that's where we get the second version, the, the Maori version of the text. Yeah. And these were taken around the country. Most chiefs signed the, the Maori version of the text. The argument is that they're separate versions because they mean different things. And it's been about 20 years now that we've known that that's not the case. They mean fundamentally the same thing. But right. Uh, these things, once they get into the bloodstream, they keep circulating. So it takes a long time to extract an idea and implant another one. Well, that's an interesting thought that you raised there because what David Seymour is wanting to do with the Treaty Principles Bill is have a conversation. And it seems there's a vast swathe of people on one particular side who say, no, we don't need to have a conversation at all about this. This has been settled. But there are no principles in the treaty, are there? No, there's not. Um, one of the problems with the treaty is that it was written in 1840. 
exactly. and it didn't foresee circumstances that took place afterwards. It's rather like a, a, a marriage. If you look at your wedding day and you say, well, look, this is my understanding of that relationship on the day I got married, but years or decades later, you have a very different type of relationship. It's still a relationship, but it's evolved because a whole lot of stuff has happened in the interim. And most countries deal with constitutional challenges like this in a formal way. So if you look at the US Constitution, when things change, should we give women the vote? Yes, they have a formal amendment process yeah. to change that document. We don't. We have an informal process, which is, well, situations have evolved. Let's apply a principle to it. And it's become a bit opaque in some cases. The principles aren't as defined as formal constitutional amendments are, say, in the US. And that's one of the challenges with it. Um, and I think, and I'm not sure what X particular bill it says, but I think what they're trying to do... It hasn't been written do, yet. Yeah, well, I suspect it has. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I think what they're trying to achieve is to say, look, we, we need to narrow down what these principles are and define them. And the problem with that will be that if you do define them, a generation later, they'll need redefinition. And there doesn't seem to be a process in place for that. So we've had a very casual process since 1975. But Arguably, it needs to be more formal and more clarity needs to be given to these principles. Whether or not this Act bill will, will allow for ongoing principles to be added is uncertain. It would seem that would be a sensible uh, creation of, in the law to add that in, to, to, to formalise some sort of ratification uh, like they do in the United States. It just it gives clarity to everyone. And I suspect in the future there may be more principles that need to be added or mm. existing principles need to be clarified, but there needs to be a process for that. And I don't think X planned legislation goes that far. This whole argument has really been ongoing since 1975 when the first idea of these principles of the treaty, I can remember growing up as a kid watching marches and hickoys and various different things, and we we're told the treaty was a fraud and a whole lot of other specious statements about the treaty and how it was a, an appalling document and all of this. And yet somehow since 1975, we've got to a position now in 2024 that the treaty is taken as gospel. It's no longer a fraud and it has a whole lot of things that it means that aren't actually in it, but we've got to honour the treaty for those imaginary things. Is that a bit simplistic? My view is well, that certainly there was real division even in the 80s as to mm. whether or not the treaty was a fraud or whether or not it should be honoured. And this is among protest groups. And the reason, mm. I think, is because there was so little understanding of what it meant at the time in 1840. If you look at the number of books published on the treaty, say, since 1990, there's dozens of them. Yeah, but quite if a you few go back, of yours too. <laughs> well, <laughs> they're the important ones, yeah. But, um, <laughs> but if, you, if you go back to the 70s, there's next to nothing. There's, no, there's very few significant published works in the 1970s dealing with what did this treaty mean. What's happened since is people have excavated as much evidence as they can and they've come up with what they think is the definitive meaning of the treaty as it applied in 1840. And increasingly, I think we'll see over the next few years, there's going to be agreement about that. Problem is, that's what's known as an originalist approach, which is what did the people want at the time of the signing of the agreement? What was in their minds? Mm. What were their intentions? And so on. Now, in, again, going back to the US, there are major problems when you apply originalists, originalist interpretations of constitutional documents, because firstly, you can never know what's going on in someone's mind. You can never know their motives. And also, it, it snap freezes a document. It says, well, this is, in this case, this is what the document said in 1840. We will stick with that. And it doesn't allow for evolution. And for constitutional documents to function, they need to evolve. They need to apply to the society at the time. Otherwise, they, they have no relevance. And so the originalist approach, which is one that's being taken by some people now, isn't necessarily helpful in that. Because you, you could run the risk that you're seeing, as you're seeing in the United States now, where various different states are applying an originalist view about a particular amendment. I think it's Amendment 14 of the Constitution. Which says that, and which was designed to stop actual insurrectionists like Confederate generals and people like that from holding public office in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, it was punitive for the losers. And so that's now being applied by various democratic states that are saying that 
Donald Trump shouldn't be on the ballot because he participated in an insurrection. Never mind he hasn't been convicted of any such thing, but they, they're taking that originalist view to try and stop him being the, the next president again. Which is precisely the problem. And mm. what it does, and you've sort of basically illustrated that point, is by freezing a, a document in a certain time and going back to that interpretation, you're denying everything that's happened afterwards historically. You're saying mm. there was no history after that document, so we have to go back to how it applied at the time. And that's always going to be a problem because obviously history keeps rolling on. The key sticking point in today's debate seems to be hinged around this word sovereignty. And reading the English version, and I've got no way of reading that. I, I, I don't understand Maori. I, I haven't learned it. I was born in Fiji, so Fijian's mm -hmm. more relevant to me than Maori is. But the English version, it doesn't mention the word sovereignty really, but it kind of does because it's saying that from now on, once you've signed this, from now on, the rules and regulations of the British Empire apply. The Queen is the head of the British Empire. And we're going to run the government and we're going to do a whole lot of other things. And we're going to protect all of these rights that you have. Now, interestingly, this was signed in 1840, eight years after emancipation of slaves in the United Kingdom. But the property of the chiefs was retained under the treaty, which also included slaves. So it was kind of weird for the British to agree to that without um, actually specifying that out. Am I, am I wrong yeah. on this? I don't well, well, firstly, it's interesting you mentioned slavery because the person who wrote the instructions for the treaty, Sir so James Stephen, was also the person who drafted the legislation abolishing slavery in Britain and the empire. Right, exactly. So it had a very strong abolitionist background to that policy. Um, the instructions, I, mean, I, I don't think for a moment they would support slavery, quite the opposite. They talk about what they called at the time civilising Maori. There'd be a, a, a government department set up under the treaty mm. called the Office of Protective Aborigines, which would educate and civilise Maori and so on, bring them into the realm of, of European life. So um, there certainly wasn't any support for anything like slavery or, or anything else that the, the British found unfavourable. What happened, though, is that these instructions then filtered through the minds of people like Hobson and Busby, who weren't particularly well educated. I think Hobson left school at the age of 12, joined the Navy. I think Busby stayed at school to the age of 15 or 16. So it's mm. in, in their sort of outlook of the world, they took these instructions and said, we'll apply them this way. Article 1, the English version, it says that all sovereignty goes to the crown. And it's really strident. It says the phrase, I think, is absolutely and without reservation. Mm. All the rights and powers of sovereignty go to the crown. Now, that's pretty clear cut. You can't misinterpret it. The problem is it's also almost impossible to imagine happening in reality. You've got to believe that 542 chiefs en masse said, yes, we, we don't want sovereignty anymore over our people. We'll just hand it over to the crown. It seems almost impossible. And these are chiefs who would fight to the death just for minor incursions of their sovereignty. So something's odd there. Um, but if you go back through British policy in, in 1838, 1839, it's, it's really clear. There's no documents which contradict this. There's a number that confirm it. Britain wanted complete sovereignty over all the territory of New Zealand, but over the basically British subjects living in that territory. So there's one document from, I think, May or June 1839, where the colonial office says, we want a treaty to govern Anglo-Saxons who have gone to live in New Zealand. In other words, we want a treaty to give us the right to have jurisdiction over our people. And we'll allow Maori sovereignty to remain intact because not for any altruistic purpose, but just because it's it's cost effective. The, the British government could barely afford an administration to govern the roughly 2,000 settlers in the country. Mm. It certainly couldn't govern the indigenous population. So, um, And they let, let those two systems go side by side until about 1843. Yeah. And even in fact, even as late as 1843, Lord Stanley says something to the effect of, apart from serious crimes like murder, the two sovereign systems will remain separate in the country. Yeah, it's interesting because on the other hand, they're also saying everybody who's in New Zealand at the time of the treaty is now a British subject. Um, not quite. Article 3, and that, that's one of the, the poorly worded parts of it, but Article 3, so, so if you take Article 1, if you believe that Britain has asserted sovereignty over everyone in the country, well, everyone would be a British subject. Yeah. You wouldn't need Article 3. But then you look at Article 3 and it says, it doesn't say that everyone will become British subjects. It's, and it talks about Maori in particular, natives New Zealand. It says they'll have the same rights and privileges of British subjects. Mm. 
So mm. either they're subject to British rule under Article 1, or they're not. They're the same rights and privileges. And so the argument is that, for example, in 1842, and a young uh, teenager, Makatu, killed a settler family. Mm. He would have the same rights and privileges as British subjects when it came to a trial. And um, it was the first case, 40 years after the treaty was signed, where British justice applied in a major case to someone who's Maori. And so he had the same rights and privileges as British subjects, but apart from cases like murder, they Maori weren't subject to British rule after the treaty. And that, that was a process that changed later on, but it wasn't Britain's intention in 1839, 1840. What about the argument that a large number of the Maori chiefs signed because they wanted essentially law and order? I mean, this is only a few short years after Hongi Hika um, obtained muskets, the ability to war. He had been to the United Kingdom. He had been to the Houses of Parliament. He had been talking to generals who had just been involved in the battles against Napoleon Bonaparte. He understood and learned the art of uh, warfare with firearms, and then proceeded to go on a marauding expedition <laughs> down the coast of New Zealand, uh, down into the Coromandel, across into the Bay of Plenty, and reportedly took over 2,000 slaves and marched them all back up north. All of those communities were ravaged by, by Hongi Hika. Now, the other thing about Hongi Hika, which is very interesting too, is that he helped create the first Maori English dictionary. Mm. Uh, so, and his daughter, who married Honi Heke, spoke fluent English and, in fact, founded a school in Kerikeri to teach Maori English. And so the, the argument that Maori didn't understand the English version, especially as the first signatory was Honi Heke, kind of doesn't hold water when you understand the relationship between Hongi Heke and Honi Heke via his, his wife. Yeah, well, I think there's probably a, a spectrum of understanding. There's, mm. I mean, certainly at Waitangi, there's the day of the the, ex, the meeting, which was the 5th of February, the day before the signing. Um, there were four hours of straight discussion. Mm. Henry Williams is translator. So you've got a group of chiefs sitting there, Hobson answering questions, and and, and it goes on for four hours. So I think you'd, you'd be fairly safe to say those chiefs understood yeah. in general terms what the treaty was about. But then you look at, at what happens around the rest of the country, where you get you know, a missionary or an official going somewhere, giving a really scanty explanation of, of what this is, and, and maybe saying, look, if you sign this, we'll protect you from your neighbouring hapu that mm. keeps attacking you. That sort of inducement. So there's very little understanding of the treaty, and that problem is compounded by the fact that no chiefs were given a copy of the agreement. So even if they could read English um, or read Te Reo, either way, it was read out to them. But read out with other promises as well. Mm. So it's rather like, you know, you, you go to buy a used car and someone says, oh, it's got air conditioning, it's got electric windows, central locking, all this sort of stuff, but it's not put in writing. And you remember those promises, but then you get the car and it's got none of those. Now, your oral history says, well, no, that, I was told that, but then the, the seller says, well, no, there's no documentation for that, it's just the ownership papers. So what people were told and what they were actually later given, and I, later I mean decades later, given a copy of the treaty, um, can be quite different things. So there's a, there's a vast spectrum of understanding. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we'll never know what all those are because there just aren't the records where each signature was accompanied by a detailed explanation of what was explained to that chief. That, that doesn't exist. So it's just speculation as to who understood what at the time. It's interesting you raise the, the car analogy. It kind of makes it sound like it's a contract, but the treaty's not a contract, is it? No, um, and it's one of those misused terms. Contracts apply, well, they, they provide for under domestic law. So you're in a country and it has a law that specifies what contracts are and how they apply and so on. Mm. Contracts are very detailed in terms of performance. So if you have a higher purchase agreement, um, it'll be, Page is a very small print covering every eventuality. And if you breach them, it's a very simple, straightforward, prescribed process for enforcement. Treaties aren't like that at all. Firstly, they're between sovereign states, not within a sovereign state. Secondly, they don't have provision for enforcement. And thirdly, they're not written like contracts. They don't have precise requirements for There's performance. There's no penalties or performance no. indicators or anything like that, no. is there? No, and the precision isn't there in the wording either because they're more 
they really do rely on mutual goodwill. That They're kind each- of motherhood and apple pie statements, aren't they? We're going well, to be nice to you and protect you, and you're going to do this, and and we're going to do this thing together, um, and we'll all be happily live happily ever after. That's kind of what well, it is, isn't it? Well, in a way, I mean, the analogy is often been used. It's, it's rather like wedding vows that mm. you know you don't have. You know, when you when you get married, you don't have. I promise to do the ironing every Thursday night. Um, <laughs> yeah, in hindsight, or cook, maybe or cook you should. meals on alternate days, or that's right. You don't have the details of that relationship because they'll be worked out in the course of the relationship. But you do have some general statements of intent that both parties agree to, and the only thing that binds that relationship together is the intent of both parties to be part of it. So it's not both parties, though, is it? What it is is that there was no sovereign nation of Maori. I mean, Maori just means people. So. Well, um, that's not how the British saw it in 1839, and this, that's a crucial point because treaties are between sovereign states, these sorts of treaties. Mm. So in 1839, in August, August the 14th, um, the British government said, we formally recognise Maori sovereignty as a precursor to getting this treaty signed. They did say, though, they qualify that and said, it's not a single sovereignty as we have in, in Britain. It's fractured among many different tribes. I mean, so they Br- said, yeah, but, but I mean, Britain had got to the point by 1840, there was a single sovereign nation. And obviously the history of of Britain before that, there was many different, you know, mm. Saxon kingdoms. There was Wessex and Sussex and um, there was, um, you know, Northumbria and Mercia and all of those Saxon things. Of course, they all replaced the Roman rule that was in there. And before that, the various different British tribes like the Cantai, et cetera, yeah, you know, the UK has evolved into a single sovereign nation. Right. And in 1840, it saw itself quite rightly as a single mm. sovereign state. It saw Maori sovereignty as fractured, but nonetheless sovereign. Yeah. And so they said different tribes, they called them petty tribes um, yeah. governing themselves. But they, they, they're they very clear. This is an agreement between two sovereign entities. Yeah. Or, or, or between one sovereign entity and multiple sovereign entities. Yes, but they they bundled those multiple ones <laughs> together, and that that was, I think, a, a necessary thing to do because, as I say, these agreements had to be between sovereign states, and yep. if they hadn't done that, with whom is the agreement? And that would be a problem. There's some thought that Honey Hickey prompted the treaty because he was doing deals with American uh, interests. At the time, what's your view on that? Um, no, not at all. Um, there's there's a very clear sort of paternity when it comes to how that treaty came about. Mm. I mean, Hickey was unknown to the the British in the 1830s in, in terms of officials in London. He obviously rose to prominence in, in 1844, 45. But in the 1830s, when the policy was being developed, he was largely unknown. And look, there, there were. American interests in New Zealand. There were French ships occasionally coming here, ships from all over the place. Mm. Britain was doing its best not to get involved in New Zealand. And there's a bit of a myth that Britain had this avaricious appetite to consume as many colonies as possible and to, to just enlarge its empire for the sake of it. That's not true. If you look at what Britain was trying to do from really the 1810s through to 1839, it's, they did everything in their power not to get officially involved in New Zealand because it would involve commitment and cost for not much benefit. A very financial mercenary decision. Um, why Why bother? And, but they were dragged into it because there were problems with lawlessness and um, humanitarian concerns in Britain that you know, Britain had a responsibility for its subjects around the world. Yeah, I mean, they, they they had their colony in New South Wales where they were busily exporting petty criminals um, to, and it was causing no end of problems over there. They kind of didn't want to get into a similar situation in New Zealand. Yeah, and they couldn't even afford it. I mean, look, when they appointed Busby as resident in 1833, they couldn't afford to send anyone to support him, a secretary or a, a police constable or anyone. They, they just didn't have the funds. And so the idea that, you know, Britain was – chomping at the bit to try to get into New Zealand and take it over, that that couldn't be further from the truth. Well, at that time, they're still busily paying for a war against um, France mm. and Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, which consumed vast uh, sums of money. You know, it started in the Peninsula Wars, obviously, um, and then graduated to the final confrontation at Waterloo. And it's only a few years after that that, that we've, we're seeing the Treaty of Waitangi being signed in you know, Britain was probably 
somewhat impoverished from having that large standing army uh, in operation for such a length of time. It's only a matter of months after the, the treaties signed that the British government is saying to Hobson, you've got to become self-supporting financially mm. because we're going to pull the plug on funding. So things were that bad, uh, absolutely. And um, Hobson almost drove the country to bankruptcy, was government. Um, his successor, Fitzroy, likewise was bordering on on bankruptcy. I mean, it was really, really a shortage of funds. Which which then leads to why you would have a treaty in the first place, because you want to stabilise um, society so that you can have amenable trade situations occurring. Yeah, although, uh, to be fair to New Zealand, there was a lot of trade going on for decades before the oh, treaty, yes. and Britain was very happy with that. Um, you know, if, uh, if you sat down for a Sunday roast in Sydney in the 1830s, the chances are the pork and potatoes were produced in New Zealand and exported there. So great, great trade before the treaty. Um, but but Britain did feel it had a, an obligation. When you're getting to 1,500, 2,000 of your subjects in a country and they're, they're lawless and they are causing problems, um, you do have a, a sort of moral obligation. And this was a period in, in British colonial history where moral concerns were more important. Yeah, so the motive is for the British is to limit their expenditure gain some dominion of some sort over the British subjects that were living in in New Zealand at the time. Maori motives are, you know, we we don't really know other than what was said and at the time and what was subsequently um, said again at uh, Koe Marama some 20 years later. And now it's evolved into this scrap over sovereignty. And it seems that there's an argument that we will ha- should have uh, some sort of power sharing arrangement. But I find it difficult to grasp that concept. And, and people might say I'm stupid, but you know, uh, you've got Queen Victoria, who eventually became the Empress of India, but was the was the head of the British Empire, a primary in the world, really, of a military power. Obviously, they had lost the American colonies by this time, but they were still a force to be reckoned with. They had uh, the Royal Navy and all of its might and firepower and all of that. And the modern interpretation is that that queen and her representatives signed an agreement on an equal footing with, as you said, what was around 500 disparate uh, groupings represented by signatories to the treaty. It, It doesn't kind of make sense either. Well, it does in the sense that what Britain wanted was, as I say, that to regulate its unruly settlers, mm. and it needed formal permission to extend its jurisdiction into the country. Not interesting, they didn't do this in Australia. In New South Wales, they just they just walked in. They had a very different view of the indigenous population there. To well, they just declared that they didn't exist. Well, that's it. Yeah, that, that, they <laughs> basically denied it's their, empty yeah, land. That's it, and um, very very different situation here. And so Britain said, look, we need some sort of arrangement to allow our jurisdiction to extend to New Zealand. And the the treaty was the vehicle to achieve that. Mm. Then you can look at the rest of the 19th century and say, well, it's a history of that sovereignty spreading to encompass everyone in the country, by and large through acquiescence, sometimes through force. But by the end of the 19th century, that sovereignty is singular. There's no alternative in the country. Well, that occurred in 1852 with the New Zealand Constitution Act, didn't it? Eff- effectively, legally. Legally, yeah, that's right. And um, that pushed aside the treaty as far as the British were concerned. I mean, they, it, it makes no mention of the treaty in that act. And it created a form of representative government. But obviously, a lot of Maori still felt, well, look, you know, we're not covered by this. Um, and there were a number of tribes, don't forget, who didn't sign the treaty. So as far mm. as they were concerned, their sovereignty was still absolutely intact. But they got their hands out for treaty settlements, though. <laughs> um, well, that was that was under the 75 Act. And the problem is a few whakapapa to different hapu and iwi, some of whom signed, some didn't, the complexities are enormous. It's, it, you can't unravel that tangle. So the government decided it would be simpler to consider that all Māori are covered by the treaty, even if their ancestors didn't sign it, just makes it a, a more straightforward process for dealing with treaty claims. What about the myths of a real treaty in the fourth article, you know, the Littlewood Treaty, I think you call okay. it? Okay, yeah, well, the Littlewood Treaty, that's a, a bit of a conspiracy theory, really. There's been a lot of research done on this, um, and it's it's a document. It's a, 
a copy of one of the texts. Yeah. And it's and there were dozens of copies probably made in that, that period because you can imagine it. You didn't have photocopiers, did they? No. So you had to hand write them. Especially if you want to if you want to know what's going to happen to the only thing you own in the world, which is your plot of land. Mm. Yeah. So you'll you'll get a copy of someone's copy of, and you can know the problems that happen with that. It's called a treaty, and the wording's slightly different from the actual treaty. It's not a treaty, and you can test this very simply. No one signed it. I mean, that's the first major yeah. hurdle. So for a treaty to be a treaty, you need some names attached to it. But there are other problems with it as well. But it's something that people have latched onto. But the fourth article is its another odd emergence. This came about, I think, in the 1990s, and the Catholic Church was really responsible for this. I think they were trying to gain some foothold in the whole treaty thing. So they... They said Bishop Pompalia, the, the Catholic bishop who arrived here in 1838, he was concerned, allegedly, that um, Catholic chiefs, those chiefs who converted Catholicism, wouldn't be covered by the treaty. And he asked Hobson, would they be covered? And Hobson said, look, basically, Catholic chiefs, Protestant chiefs, chiefs who retain their original beliefs, they'll all be covered by the treaty. There's no discrimination against anyone. Mm. Um, and that's just, in a sense, common sense, because there's nothing in the treaty that excludes you on the basis of religion. It wasn't even a consideration, and that was it. It was a. It was a, uh, uh, privately, of course. Pompeo was encouraging chiefs not to sign it. He was quite subversive about this, but um, publicly, oh, he was French and Catholic. So there you go. Yes, but um, even so, it was what he, he was saying to chiefs: if you sign this, you'll become a slave. That's what he was telling them. Yeah, I think most. Which, of course, had, is the most heinous thing that you could be if you're a yeah. chief to be then turned into a slave. That'd be. You'd be appalled at such a prospect. Exactly. Um, most of them had the good sense to ignore him. Um, so he made he made he asked that question. The, the reply came from Hobson. What the Catholic Church did in the nineties is say, this is a, a promise made at the time of a signing of a treaty, and under international law, verbal promises made at the time of a signing constitute part of the treaty. They constitute as much as a written promise does. Except you can't prove a, a, a verbal promise, can you? It, it becomes problematic. 400 so, years later. Well, there, there's, there's certainly a recording, uh, you know, a rough transcript, let's call it. One yeah. of the missionaries recorded what Pompalia said. There are a whole lot of problems with this. Firstly, international law in this area is not retroactive, so it doesn't apply to treaties signed in the 19th century that verbal promises were made. So that's a general international law principle where it stumbles, but it stumbles for a whole lot of other reasons. Secondly, at most, perhaps eight or nine percent of the signatories of the treaty heard that comment. Over 90 percent never did because it was only made at Waitangi. It wasn't made at any of the other signings. So the vast majority of chiefs never heard that comment. Thirdly, there were all sorts of other comments made. There were four hours of commitments and promises and clarifications. So we could have dozens and hundreds perhaps of these so-called articles added. It's just a mischievous claim and it has no substance. And what's interesting is in the, in the early 21st century, the government, the tribunal have quietly dropped it. So there's yeah, still a few. Hear, I mean, the, the, when I read your article, that was kind of the first I'd heard about it. So it's not a, it, it's a conspiracy theory that's kind well, of waned, isn't it? I th- I, yeah, I think it'd be, I don't know if it's conspiracy theory. I think it's just a, a, an act of desperation that people are clutching at something and saying, well, it means this. And is it, there's another element to it as well, which is taking contemporary values that, that society has and projecting them back into 1840. So what was pronounced by this so-called fourth article is that, ah, look, the treaty guarantees religious freedom, freedom of expression, and so on. Well, it doesn't do that. It manifestly doesn't. But yeah. people are saying, well, these are our values now. How do we work them into that 1840 text? And we'll do it this way. We'll hijack it. We'll smuggle it in through a mythical article. And it, it was a lot of bogus international law arguments used. And it was, it was quite embarrassing. But as I say, it's it's fallen from view now. Where to now then? You know, there's a, a lot of anger, misconception on, on both sides. Uh, but But I saw a lot of the speeches at Waitangi uh, at Ratana this year, were saying that David Seymour's Treaty Principles Bill is seeking to rewrite the treaty. But it's not, is it? Well, again, it hasn't been released. Um, oh, sure, but absolutely but... not. But the, all, all the discussion so far is about addressing the principles to yeah. narrow them down to give them some sort of slightly clearer legal definition. Um, mm. It's not really dealing with the text itself. However, so many of the settlements are based on treaty principles. So in a sense, it 
it's challenging the basis on which some of those settlements were made. So the, the treaty is the text plus the principles. And, and the principles sort of, aren't defined. So we've got um, settlements yeah. on principles that have been defined by activist judges or or the Waitangi Tribunal or or whatever, which seems to be now ex expanding its purview to cover anything it feels like. Um, well, the tribunal is legally charged to determine the meaning of the treaty by applying principles to it. Mm. Um, uh, there's all sorts of principles that could be added. You can imagine just about anything. They could say, well, this, this is a principle based on the treaty. So the tribunal lately has had a lack of rigour in that respect, historical rigour. And I'm not alone in saying this. There are a number of historians who have, some of them more subtly, but said this is a problem. The tribunal hasn't got a, a particularly good grip, even on some of the history it produces. It, And that's mm. that's unfortunate. The standard isn't what it ought to be. Well, you could argue that the standard of jurisprudence in New Zealand is not the standard it should be either. Well, I, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I, I couldn't <laughs> no. Now, you wrote an article in August 2023 about uh, our system of governance. It was entitled Far From Perfect But Still Better Than The Alternatives. And I guess that's kind of prescient given the arguments that, or the discussions that we're having now in, in that – Legally and effectively, the New Zealand Constitution Act in 1852 superseded the treaty and applied sovereignty over everybody in New Zealand. Right? We only had a population of 90,000 at that time. <laughs> you know? um, but then uh, su subsequent to that, we've had a number of changes, the most significant, of course, being the change from first-past-the-post to MMP. And it could be argued that that also superseded the treaty. If you look at what the treaty was intended to do, as I say, was to allow British jurisdiction to apply to British subjects in the country. Mm. But implicit in treaties, and not, not very finely tuned, but very in a very general sense, implicit is that circumstances will change and we will evolve with those changes. Mm -hmm. And that's why the, the treaty is fairly loosely written. Yeah. And yes, in 1852, the British decided, well, we've had enough of it. It served its purpose. Um, remember, the treaty introduced a system of government, which was basically a dictatorship, where you had a, a governor appointed by London who, who was not voted in. There were no elections in the country, no representatives. So the governor could make laws as he chose. That, that was the system that the treaty ushered in. And Britain replaced that with a, a democratic system in 52. Here's the problem, though. Britain completely negated the treaty effectively through the Constitution Act, but the other party wasn't consulted in this. So as far as mm. they were concerned, the, the Maori view is that, look, you know, we signed the treaty. Now, these people are going around playing with it or saying it doesn't exist or doesn't apply. Well, no one's asked us. Well, as far as we're concerned, it still does. This is, this is the only agreement we gave our consent to. So you've got a, a, a gap opening up in 1852-53 onwards. Mm. And that gap's exacerbated a bit by some of the restrictions on voting. So obviously only men could vote, but you had to own that land. That Maori men too, though. Um, well, in 1853, it did, if you own land. The problem is most Maori land then was still communally owned. Mm. So almost no Maori could vote in 53 for the elections. Um, so basically you get only Europeans voting. That, again, widens the breach. Maori said, look, we gave our consent for this through a treaty. Now you've introduced a system for governing where we're effectively excluded. Now, that changed later on. but um, So there were all these sort of problems wedging the relationship apart from that time. Mm. And Britain didn't give due consideration to the treaty when it passed the, the 52 Act. I think it just thought, well, look, the treaty is something way back in 1840. It doesn't apply anymore. The situation in New Zealand has, has outgrown it. I think that was the British view then. Mm. Maori view was quite different. I mean, his, it's a truism now that there were breaches of the treaty, some minor and some rather major. Um, you know, you just have to look at a map of the roads in the Waikato to understand that. And a lot of people might not realise this, but in the Waikato, um, when it came to building roads uh, under the law, it said that you had to compensate the owners for the land that you took to build the road, except if you're married, you didn't have to con compensate them at all for taking the land. And so you'll see uh, long straight roads in the Waikato that all of a sudden start meandering for no apparent reason uh, until you find out that, well, actually, that's where the Maori land was and they were 
made the road as much as possible on the Maori land to minimise the cost to building the road. Mm. Yep. Um, so, and- you know, there's terrible um, breaches, uh, terrible occurrences of, of bad faith, um, and we've had a treaty process, uh, treaty reconciliation or treaty settlement process that by and large, apart from Napui really, has settled most of those things. But we seem to be opening up this, or picking the scab of this wound again uh, with the Treaty Principles Bill. But should we just not have it, have the discussion? Should we Should we just ignore that? Should we do what uh, a large number of Maori are suggesting in academics and particularly the media suggesting that we don't need to have this debate or should we have the debate? If you go back to the marriage analogy, how would you deal with a problem? Well, you cannot. Counselling. <laughs> yeah, well, you could not talk about it. Um, and But then it leads to divorce. And this is what, where it gets interesting. So we talk about settling claims, but there's a difference between settling them and resolving them. So if, mm. if you get divorced, for example, you can settle that relationship. And financially, you know, you split yeah. it however it's split, and that's it. You go separate ways. It's settled, but it's not resolved. And most people who are divorced do carry around some degree of baggage about the experience. Mm. Mm. And that resolution can, for some people, burn them up completely. Yeah, And I think we, we're reasonably good at settling treaty claims in this country. We're not good at dealing with the resolution part of it. And I don't know if, if that's even possible because I don't think any country has really dealt with that particularly well with, with any sort of conflict. So how do you resolve these things? How do you actually get to the point where you can put them behind you? And you can see in other parts of the, world, in the Middle East and the Balkans, people carry around things for centuries and they just keep flaring up and keep flaring up. Oh, we're looking at that right now, aren't we, in, in uh, Gaza? Yeah. You know, and centuries, um, in fact, millennial uh, grudges being held mm. uh, and not even being settled. No. Much less resolved. That's it. And the example you gave of, of Britain was interesting because if you look at the Angles and the Sacks, the Saxons and the, and the Picts and all the other groups. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's anyone really in Britain now who gets aggrieved by that. No one says, look, my ancestors were Saxons um, and you know, I have a real grievance about this. I'm really concerned about it. Uh, what's happened is that the society evolves over time to the point in some cases where these things get left in the past. Mm. But other societies don't. And it's it's part of the transmission mechanism of concern that some cultures have it have a system where, well, that's what it is. Um, other cultures have a thing, look, yeah, you know, this has caused us problems, we we remember it. And that's a very simplistic way of putting it. And it's an extreme way, but that there are cultural differences that affect how these things are dealt with. I mean, it may be that part of the problem in New Zealand is we actually haven't had a decent war to settle these things once and for all with, with conquest, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if you look at the UK, uh, at the history of that, you had multiple tribes, disparate tribes. The Romans come uh, swanning in and have a regimented system and swamp every single one of those tribes, uh, apply Roman rule to the whole country, which eventually wanes after three or 400 years, leaving a vacuum for the Germanic uh, tribes, the uh, Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, uh, to come in. Nobody wanted Scotland. Not even the Vikings wanted Scotland. <laughs> so when, they, when they came marauding, it's like a barren wasteland. Let the Picts have it. Um, you know, you've even got uh, then you've got you know Dane law and all of those sorts of things where communities were conquered, displaced, uh, ravaged, etc. Over a number of years. I mean, obviously, you've got William the Conqueror coming in again. That was that was you you know your Vikings that had settled in Normandy, who then came back to the UK to to apply Norman law and, um, uh, you know, that's all just absorbed over hundreds of years. We're trying to do the same sort of thing, but inside 200 years, yep, which except is the blink that, of the eye, you know, really. Well, it is, except that it doesn't always, and again, it's a cultural thing. Um, if you look at uh, the, the Ottoman Empire is a very good example, mm. you know, the, the Turks and the Balkans, they were there for 500 years and they imposed their system of rule, their system of taxation and so on. And 500 years afterwards, people still would go back to, say, the 1300s and say, well, look, you did this then. And that became the cause of a whole lot of wars at the end of the 20th century, for goodness mm. sake. So mm. in some cases, people have longer memories and cultures keep things alive better than others. Um, and maybe that enforced forgetfulness has something to it. I don't know. But going back to a personal approach to it, 
how do you deal with these things with bad experiences in the past? Do you allow, allow them to brew inside you? Do you cast them aside or what? And that's well, we all know different. that personally, brewing things inside you doesn't lead to anywhere good. But can you help it? This is the thing. I mean, that's true. But for some people, there's no alternative. They simply that's how they are. They're wired that well, way. Yeah. I mean, that's why I think we should have these discussions in a reasonable and considered manner. I mean, we don't agree a hundred percent on on elements of history for whatever reason. It might, might be upbringing, could be we've read different books or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I'm right and you're wrong, or or that you're right and I'm wrong. We have a discussion, maybe you learn something from each other, and then we come to a shared view of where we can go. And, and you know, I, I don't subscribe to shutting down a debate because it might be uncomfortable. I think we need to have uncomfortable discussions. And yeah. these are very uncomfortable discussions. Yeah, but I think we should have them. Yeah, I don't know if they're necessarily uncomfortable. I mean, if, if, if your goal well, is for to... some people. Well, then they have to examine why that is. Because if mm. your goal is to move towards the truth and you're right we'll never agree we'll never get get an absolute truth um it's the nature of history because you can put more, again go back to the divorce thing you, you talk to one party in the divorce what's their version of why the relationship mm. broke up mm. and talk to the other party totally different views of exactly the same events using the same evidence yep. so you, you'll never get full agreement but the idea is to try to approximate the truth to try to inch our way towards what actually is true and I don't know why anyone would find that uncomfortable. Well, it seems there are some people who find it uncomfortable. They don't want to have a debate about what the treaty principles are. I mean, David Seymour is very brave in putting that up, but I don't think he's actually fully elucidated his thinking behind that. And that no. Maybe that's a problem too. Maybe that vacuum of, of clarity is something that will agitate people and say, well, look, what is at, at risk here? We don't know because nothing's been specified about that. Mm. Well, and also, I think the by and large, the vast bulk of the media in New Zealand don't want to have that debate either. They've made their mind up that David Seymour is evil for even producing such an idea, and therefore we should shut down the debate. And we're not going to have that debate. And I'm 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 adamant that we actually should have the debate. It might not clear the air, but at least gets people talking. Because right now we seem to have these implacable forces that are butting up against each other, and that only leads somewhere. Uh, terrible, as does the creation of an ethno state, and and we're running the risk of doing that too. And uh, we've seen it never works. It's never worked anywhere in the world. There needs to be a shared vision. And whilst we've got these groups of people that don't want to share a vision, then we're going to have conflict over this, whether it's argy bargy words or actually worse. And I'm worried that it'll go worse. I think one of the challenges with a debate is obviously you need goodwill, but you also need to be clear about are you prepared to be wrong? And this is mm. this is something I, I sort of deal with every day. I, I when I research something, I always go into it knowing I could be wrong. And so I, I pressure test what I do. And in this there's one case, for example, I got other people to say, look, I want you to find faults with this. I want you to, mm. you know, and if they do, great. I mean, I, I really and welcome that. you can that. debate that point and see. Yeah, and or just say, you know, and, I was wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I, I stuffed up here. I put too much emphasis on this document or I ignored this one. And yes, I apologize. And, and that's that's how it should be. Unfortunately, I think in some cases on this treaty debate, people are already digging big trenches to say, we're not moving. We're in here for the long haul. This is our view. No amount of evidence fired at us is going to shift us from our position. And this is probably on all sides of the argument. To some extent, you'll find people like that. So we can have all the debate we want, but it won't budge that front line. It'll be stuck there because people have decided this is what I think in advance. And no amount of evidence will convince me otherwise. And particularly people wrapped up in certain ideologies, the ideology trumps mm. the evidence. And yeah. that's a big concern too, because you're not arguing on points of fact, you're arguing on, well, this is my worldview. Yeah, and it's belief. Nothing it's, you're arguing on beliefs, not facts. Yeah. And that, that's, that's very difficult. So a, a debate in that environment becomes complex. And then you multiply it by thousands of different views and, and dozens of different ideological standpoints, and it becomes a tangle. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the reason why I got you on the show is to to look at those viewpoints. You know, David Rankin will have another viewpoint. Uh, Margaret Mutu has another um, uh, viewpoint. Elizabeth Rata has a, another mm. viewpoint. Somewhere in all of that, if we just talk, 
we should be able to find some points of agreement, although I'm pretty certain that Margaret Mutu is implacable and is not going to move. <laughs> you know, just the feeling that I get. But, hey, maybe I'll get her on the show and we'll have a discussion around that too. But, you know, I think it's important that we do have a debate about this because it all started because somebody wrote a law that said we must honour the principles of the treaty. That's it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the, actually, it, it, the law is actually a lot subtler. It's, it really said when we're, we're trying to work out how to resolve grievances under this treaty, and remember at the time, the 70s, the text was very little understood. How do we do this? Well, well, we'll establish principles based on the text to help us resolve those claims. And that was where the, the, the idea of the principles came from, because the text was not adequate yeah. to cover current situations. And remember, when the Act was passed in 1975, it only applied to grievances for events that took place after the passage of the Act. So any breaches of the treaty after 1975. Right. And it wasn't until 1985 that they amended the law under the Longy regime to apply to grievances going back to 1840. So for the first 10 years of its life, the tribunal only considered current breaches of the treaty. Do you agree with Shane Jones's position that the Waitangi Tribunal has become slanted? Um, I think it, it's it's fallen victim to some substandard research. And the concern with that is that there isn't a mechanism to correct what they do. Mm. And as I said, there are a lot of historians who come across this when they're doing their research. They'll look at a tribunal report and go, oh, gosh, they've missed out this or they've misinterpreted this. And these are quite severe misinterpretations in some cases. Um, the treatment of evidence is unusual. It's not the sort you would expect. Mm. There's it's no mechanism. The final, it's the final arbiter, though, isn't it? There's no ability. Well, it reckon, it has, to the Supreme Court, for example, to well, say but, the Waitangi Tribunal got this wrong. Um, to a point, uh, the, the tribunal can't make decisions apart from one tiny exception. The tribunal has the power to make recommendations and it's up to the Crown to act on those recommendations. Um, but in the absence of any other body or any check and balance beyond the tribunal, those recommendations carry quite a bit of weight. Mm. But again, it's inflected by what politicians of the day think about it. And there's a funny relationship there. The tribunal may be inclined to moderate its recommendations in order to make them more likely to go through, or they might emphasize certain recommendations to say, well, look, this is what we think regardless and put our stake in the ground. So there's that sort of dynamic that inevitably affects how the, the final recommendations are shaped. I guess the I guess the debate is not settled. You wouldn't you would agree it's not settled. Clearly not. <laughs> and it's not resolved either. Yeah, no. And you made the distinction between settled and resolved, mm. right? We've settled a whole lot of uh, treaty grievances with claim, you know, claims in the, in the process, but the resolution hasn't occurred. You know, there was a thought, you know, and I, and I know Doug Graham pretty well, and I remember having long discussions with him back in the 90s, and he was saying, no, no, if we do all of this, then all the problems will go away. Well, they haven't, because that there's a, a disconnect between settlement and resolution. Yeah, and it's exacerbated by the size of the settlement. Mm. So let's say you know, you're a married couple, been together five, six years, you, you bought a house and you divorced, you get half each. Yeah. That's a settlement. Now, there'll still be a sense of lack of resolution because, you know, he or she has taken away my future and I only got half a house or whatever. And that's natural. So it can be settled, but it's not resolved. But what happens on this scale? What happens if is the settlement represents half of 1% of what you're entitled to, which is what the average treaty settlement is for historical claims. Mm. So you walk away from the, the whole relationship, as it were, or it terminates. You get half of 1% of the value of what you're entitled to. So one of the arguments is that the settlements themselves are a source of grievance. Mm. Then you, you compound that. Who gets the settlement? Well, it's ma made in the name, say, of a tribe. Yeah, you know, and that's what I was thinking about. What we've been discussing is how, yeah, you know, we've got the settlement process, and it's done by iwi and mm. devolving down to hapu, et cetera. Well, it's meant to, it doesn't meant to, but it kind of doesn't. Except in Napui, that's where the, the problems lie. But yeah, you know, the the average Maori New Zealander is not seeing any benefit of the settlement well, process. Uh, here's what's what's happening in a couple of cases at the moment that there are some people who are preparing claims to the tribunal. Now, you can't put any more historical claims in. Mm. It's well over a decade now that the government said no more historical claims. But there are some people who are preparing claims now, one or two, saying that the settlements themselves are breaches of the treaty because the Crown settled with Iwi. 
but not one iwi signed the treaty. It was yeah. a hapu. No chief said, I'm signing this on behalf of the whole iwi. They said, I'm signing it on behalf of my hapu. And so the Crown should have settled with a party it made the agreement with, but it hasn't. It's settled with these big conglomerations because it's convenient and much faster. So they're arguing that the settlements themselves breached the treaty and therefore need to be relitigated. And that's there's some substance in that argument that the Crown has taken the shortcut in some cases and gone for a settling whole big areas of land. So I think it can turn around and say, look, we've sorted this out, we've sorted that out. Not taking into account the fact that well, we've, we've settled with the wrong people. <laughs> now, that's an argument. That's, it, there are good arguments to say that they can settle with Iwi, but um, it's, it's not quite as clear cut. No. But if we haven't got settlement and we haven't got resolution, then we shouldn't be shutting down debate, should we? No, we need... And this really is, you know, the the whole system is kept alive by that, that debate sort of flowing through it. Because if you say, this is it, you will get no more. Just be quiet. You've got your settlement. Shut up. Be grateful. Well, if you don't feel there's a sense of resolution there, that doesn't go away. It's just going to belch to the surface somewhere else. And that isn't being dealt with, the, the sense of a lack of resolution. Yeah, I mean, there's a large swathe of New Zealand society that believes that we've had a settlement process, there's payments been made, it's settled. Exactly. Why are you complaining even more? I mean, obviously the system, in order to get the first settlement underway, which is Tainui, included the ability for them to upgrade based on it on things. So it goes on and on and on, and that's creating even more. more. Every time Tainui gets a top-up, Everyone goes, oh, my God, this never ends. Well, it probably isn't ever going to end, is it? That, that's a proportionality thing. Um, mm. so remember, Tainui uh, accepted its settlement on the basis that it was a total pool of X amount of dollars, and they yeah. got a share of that. Government then, and this was inevitable, they said, well, we're going to actually increase the pool. So you know, they settled on, a, on a, the idea that be this many dollars, there's actually more. So they've... Mm. they've They've been worse off. So they, a lot of uh, a lot of claimants have put that proportionality provision into their their agreements. Once all historical claims have been resolved, that will be it because there won't be any other ones for uh, for the government to add more money to. It's all done. Yeah. So it, it has got a limited tenure. It will stop at some point. Um, but there are obviously the the big one, as you say, is Napui, and that's that's quite complicated. And I think Napui's probably looked south and said, well, we can see some of the problems that have emerged. We can see the scale of what we're entitled to. Um, we can see issues of who's entitled to it, representation and so on. How do we deal with that? And they haven't come up with a, a, a satisfactory response. And the fact is there isn't one. You know, there isn't the right way to do this. It's just what's the most expedient or possible way of doing it. Or affordable. Yeah. Well, Paul, it's been a real pleasure talking to you about this. It's certainly given me a few more insights and you know, answered a few questions that I had when I read your article about the myths. It's clarified a few things in my mind. Uh, hopefully the listeners will have clarified a few things in their mind too by listening to you talking about those things and the historiosity of it. And it's something I've always argued about in politics is that you have to look at context and you have to look at historiosity. I mean, I argue about this in church too, you know, when people are ta saying that, oh, the Bible says this. So yeah, but but you need to understand the politics of, of the of the era when that was written. And they all look at me and go, what? But but you do. You kind of mm. do, you know. Yep. And so that's why I want to talk to historians and people who have studied this in depth and kind of made it their life to to do that because not enough people are well informed, and and I see it as our role to inform people. Yes, so and that's all we can hope for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I appreciate you coming on the show and uh, talking about those things. It's fantastic. Yeah, thanks very much. No problem. Thanks, Paul. We ignore our history at our peril. Paul Moon knows his stuff, and I found that discussion very interesting, especially about the relevance of the treaty to our constitutional framework. Tell me your thoughts on what Paul Moon had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR.
Michael Bassett and I had a wonderful look at history of our parliament before the election. And in that discussion, he declared that the Ardern Hipkins regime were the worst government in living history. I'll check in with him to see if he still thinks that. And then I'll ask him about the challenges that Christopher Luxon's government faces. He joins me on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Michael Bassett. It's good to have you. Pleasure to be here. Now, uh, before the election, uh, we had a discussion and you decided or, or told me that you thought that the previous government was the worst government in modern history. And I pushed you a little bit further and, then, and you had to think about it, but then you agreed that perhaps was the worst government we've ever had. Do you still agree with that? Yes, I do. I mean, it was just a terrible government. Uh, they'd done no work prior to coming to office. They had more than 200 committees trying to devise things for them to do after they got to office. Uh, they had some baggage, um, nonsensical uh, ideas about the treaty and um, a bit of an approach to welfare, which if they'd known anything about Labour's tradition, uh, they'd have known it was wrong, namely that the best way to fix welfare problems is to shower them with money. And, uh, I mean, the evidence has been there for donkey's years that the more money you shower out, the more people become dependent upon it and uh, decide that free money is easier than having to work for it. And, uh, I mean, that government was so badly prepared intellectually bereft and uh, had read almost nothing about their Labour Party antecedents. And uh, therefore, I think they deserve that uh, appellation, the worst government in modern history. If you look at Grant Robertson, he took New Zealand's uh, debt from $5 billion to something like $95 billion. Mm. With the media cheering him on, you know, uh, like he was God's gift to accounting, and and then we see in recent weeks this huge uproar over, uh, you know, thirteen thousand dollars worth of uh, entitlements for the prime minister's accommodation, and they've written more words about Christopher Luxon's accommodation than they have ever written about Grant Robertson's financial prowess. Well, that's absolutely right. But then what else do you expect from the modern media? Mm. Most of them have so little academic training. They don't read much. Uh, they are sort of born lefties. They think that uh, the world owes everybody a living. And therefore, they're not inclined to uh, believe anything that comes out of uh, Luxon. I think, uh, to be fair to everybody, that Chris Luxon handled that business uh, of his entitlement for his apartment very stupidly. Uh, I mean, the obvious thing was that he should have just taken the same entitlement that all the other ministers and uh, MPs took. Namely, um, I forget what the actual sum is, but it's specified. There was a little top up if you were prime minister. And I mean, he was entitled to the same um, sum as anybody else. We see this pervasive attitude within the media. I mean, Duncan Garner wrote last week about the Warner Brothers Discovery decision to let News Hub die. And he said, did Warner Brothers Discovery HQ make every effort to save News Hub? Letting it die is not the Kiwi way. And it seems that he thinks that the Kiwi way is the state paying the huge salaries he's earned uh, when working for those organisations. And if you watch the media all the time, and uh, I think you're as good a watcher of it as I am, yep. um, uh, that's the prevailing thinking. Any problem that anybody has, the government should fix. I mean, get real. Uh, don't people have a responsibility for their own lives? And um, the same goes for business. Uh, that's a private outfit, TV3, News Hub, why on earth should the government come rushing in to uh, prop them up when they foul their nest? Well, and, the, and I don't think TV3 has ever made a profit in its entire existence. 
Probably. So, you know, it's it's sho- shoveling good money after bad. Um, yeah, TV One's not doing much better either by the look of it. Well, that's probably why Simon Power re- um, quit as the chief executive. He knew what was coming. <laughs> Might well be. But the media, I guess they're a bellwether for the challenges that Christopher Luxon's government faces. Now, you've written an article on your website, Bassett, Brash and Hyde, about the challenges of Christopher Luxon's government, apart from doing stupid things, like you mentioned about the accommodation. I mean, he should have just held his ground and it would have died. But once he vacillated, once he turned around his position, then the media then knew, well, we just have to put some pressure on Christopher Luxon and he'll do a runner. Yes, that is always the danger with that. But, uh, I mean, the real thing is, that he hadn't thought it through before it came up and became public. Of course he was entitled to the same amount that all other ministers and um, MPs are entitled to when he has to live in his own accommodation in Wellington and pay the outgoings on that. But he didn't think that through. He, he decided that the amount of money that was paid to the Prime Minister, which was substantially higher than the others got, was all okay and above board. And, I mean, if he'd gone for just the same entitlement everybody else had, who could second-guess it? But instead he backtracked on the whole thing. Mm. And now he is the only minister living in his own uh, uh, property uh, uh, who um, isn't getting any so. Nice. I mean, it, was, it was it was bad politics all around, from from Luxon to the media to the opposition crowing about it as well. And yep. now we've got the ridiculous situation where this Ardern created board that's supposed to look after this property is telling us all as taxpayers there's thirty million dollars, which we know will be fifty million dollars. Um, I don't. It, it needs to you know in repairs. Well. If it was a business looking at that proposition, we've got a house, it's dilapidated, it needs uh, significant repairs to be brought up to stand, we just make the decision to bowl the stupid thing and build something else for much less than $30 million. Well, the trouble is that you're talking to somebody who actually is responsible for a premier house in the first instance, and mm. that's me. <laughs> uh, my ministerial house was actually in the grounds of premier house, mm. and I used to have to drive past this thing every day, and slowly it was sort of crumbling. And it was the first prime ministerial house in New Zealand. Uh, Julius Vogel had it uh, in the 1870s. Mm. And, in fact, it was inhabited by all the prime ministers through until uh, Mickey Savage, who had no family and decided he didn't want to live in it in 1935, whereupon they let it be used as uh, the dental clinic Mm. and became the sort of murder house was what it used to be called yeah. until um, uh, the need for dental nurses got so low that uh, they no longer needed the training facility and pulled out, whereupon the house started to crumble. And here am I going backwards and forwards every day looking at this thing and discovering that Fran Wilde, when she became an uh, Associate Minister of Conservation in 1987, had banged a preservation order on it as an historic house. So clearly pulling it down wasn't an option. And I thought, right, I'm chairman of the 1990 commission. We're uh, going to be making grants to for various purposes around the country, Auckland, Wellington, Whanganui in particular, and Auckland. And so I put up a million dollars from the Lottery Grants Board and said this will be a present to Wellington to have this house restored. And uh, we did, and it cost a little bit more than a million, but... The thing was functional, and Geoffrey Palmer moved in as Prime Minister early in 1990. Mm. Well, the notion that it's $30 million is frankly just ridiculous to fix it. I'll bet my boots that for 2 or $3 million, you could get that place completely functional again. It is an historic house. It's probably, uh, I mean, you've no idea what we discovered in it. Mm. Uh, 
I mean, there'd been a fire in the place that had all been boarded up. I remember going and having a look at all these uh, burnt things dating back to Vogel's time that were being pulled out of mm. the place. So anyway, don't let spend too much time on Premier House. Maybe, but- maybe it needs another fire, a good long one. No, well, it's it's an historic house. I mean, I well, they burn down probably. Yes, they do. But uh, if they can be preserved, I don't think they should be. Uh, they should be allowed to burn down. No, and um, if for a relatively small sum of money, that fairly significant place, and it's it's a, got very good entertainment facilities. Mm. In it. I mean, I launched a couple of books at Premier House, uh, a couple of my political biographies, and uh, I've been to lots of functions there, and it, it's worthy of preservation, so long as it doesn't cost $30 million. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's a little known fact that in 1992, I lived for about eight or nine months at Vogel House in, uh, in Lower Hutt. Oh, really? Yes, yes, yes. Well, Doug Graham lived there at the time. And, oh, yes. um, uh, I was moving to Wellington, and so I needed some accommodation, and I stayed there. Um, you know, it was an interesting insight into how ministers live, um, the, the, you know, the time of day that they get up and go to work. And, you know, like I, I can remember Doug having his bowl of cereal and a cigar at something like five in the morning. Five in the morning? That sounds awfully early for Doug. He didn't, nothing moved him very rapidly. Oh, well, no. He was always up around 5 a.m. having breakfast and that. He was gone by six. Um, Yeah. So, you know, you don't get to know these things unless you're actually in the household. So, um, but that was an interesting um, experience living there with the ghost, apparently. Yes, I went there on a number of occasions when Longy was first, and, mm. and uh, but Longy wanted to come back to uh, town to uh, be closer to his lover, and uh, well, he had, he had crown limousines to carter around. I don't know why that was a problem. Oh, and drive your own car was better. Well, it's uh, famously apparently uh, Robert Muldoon used to drive his Triumph 2000 down the hut motorway, inebriated, um, you know, basically surrounded by police making sure he didn't crash. Well, on the night when he called the snap election in 1984, uh, the chief whip uh, ran down into the basement and let the tyres down on his car yeah. to stop him from going home. They thought, hell, with an election coming up, it'd be just our luck for him to be caught speeding or doing something crazy. Yeah, and they're totally... So anyway, let's get on to these challenges that you think that the Luxon government faces. Well, they're manifold in my view. Uh, Probably the biggest single one is the bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, I think, I mean, we've noticed that there are leaks taking place all the time. I mean, that's a terrible thing to do, to leak a cabinet paper before it's even been seen by the minister, let alone seen by the cabinet, Mm. uh, is a high crime and misdemeanour in uh, terms of how civil servants should operate. And um, they have clearly gotten a head of steam on And I think it's because they had so much to do with the policy of the Labour Party when they were in office, that six years they were there, that they've come to treat the Labour policies as though they were their own. And uh, they don't like the thought that uh, they're going to be unravelled. Many of them have been unravelled now. More will be, and there's a substantial change of direction. But worse than that... There's nearly 16,000 more of them on the payroll, all enjoying uh, quite uh, luxurious uh, by comparable standards uh, in the private sector incomes. And uh, they don't want to lose their jobs. And so consequently, they're determined to make life as difficult for this government as possible. And there seems to be, as yet, I, I don't think there's a new head of the civil service I think the Public Service Commissioner was was going to retire. Whether he has, I don't know. Yeah, he's announced his retirement, but he's he's still there. Yeah, and, and they haven't got a, a successor. 
as far as I know. And um, I mean, that successor has one tough job. He's going to have to convince a very unprepossessing collection of heads of departments, several of whom should have offered their resignations when the government changed, to actually behave and uh, make sure that their um, employees follow the rules, like supporting the actions, not out campaigning for them, but doing what the uh, new ministers want. Yeah, I mean, a classic case of that is this repeal of the rather stupid smoking legislation that Labor brought in. And we culminated in Hipkins screeching across the House, this policy will kill people. You know, there was never any screeching when the other policies that he did that would demonstrably kill people. But it was just ludicrous because the smoking rates were dropping anyway. They were below the targets that were set uh, many years ago for smoking rates. And it was an ideological uh, burp, uh, to paraphrase, um, I think it was Michael Cullen. David, David Longy. Or David Longy, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was either one, of the, one or other of them, the only two brains that they had between them, you know. So it was a ridiculous policy that there was no need for it at all. And now we've got this claim that, oh, Maori are going to be disadvantaged because they smoke more than others. And they ignore the logical conclusion that you come to, which is, well, if Maori are going to be so terribly affected by this, well, why don't we just legislate to say no Maori can buy cigarettes? <laughs> but can you imagine the outcry if that yes, happened? I can imagine the outcry uh, uh, quite easily. Oh, I was the first Minister of Health to introduce the tobacco tax to mm. lift it in the budget of 1984. At that time, about 28% of the population smoked. Mm. And as the rate of tax has gone up, the number of smokers has fallen substantially and it's down to 6% now. Yeah. Well, you have to say that that policy is working um, I mean, you don't see many people smoking these days. Uh, it's rather rare. And uh, if they are smoking, then they've had to pay a fortune for it. So the policy that the Labor Party had introduced, a huge uh, sort of a sledgehammer to uh, uh, crack a nut. Mm. Uh, and um, besides, it hadn't come into force yet anyway. Exactly. And yeah, It was ridiculous. Uh, and so the, uh, the new government kicked it. And the problems, I mean, there's even a fool of a, of a cartoon in the Herald this morning that uh, has somebody holding a fag. Very sad and unnecessary nonsense. But that's the media, you see. They're, they're as much agitators as these embedded uh, civil servants who think that the policy ideas are theirs and they're sacrosanct. But what we saw with the Labour government uh, in, over the last six years or the preceding six years was this locking in of spending with no accountability for, A, where the money's going to come from in the future, and B, uh, no accountability for, is this, um, you know, effective ways to spend taxpayers' dollars? And then the moment the new government comes in and says, right, we're going to remove that spending or we're going to remove that, it's calamitous. The world's ending. Um, you know, this spending means that kids are going to starve you know, before we had free lunches at schools, how did the kids get to school and what did they eat then? Well, I mean, you know. Strangely enough, their parents actually accepted some responsibility for them. Mm. Parents, parents, I mean, and even if you're a beneficiary, the benefit is actually paid for the kid and for looking after the child, not for lying in bed and um, uh, bonking or whatever it is uh, you're choosing to do when mm. you be up. Um, making your kids lunch and sending it to school, making sure it goes to school, uh, I should say. Uh, but, I mean, the, the money that is paid on behalf of the child is treated as though it is a parental entitlement mm. by far too many people. And uh, I am of the opinion that until such time as you follow the money, you're not going to get parents doing their job properly. It is possible to marry up attendance rates at school with benefit payments. And uh, as soon as 
you started to deduct money from uh, benefits because the kids weren't sent to school. They all of a sudden turn up at school, don't they? I think you, they certainly will, and I think the parents will have a, will ha- suddenly realise that they have a vested interest in getting the kid to school. But uh, life has just been made too easy, and I blame Carmel Cipollone. We were talking earlier about the worst government. She is unbelievably the worst Minister of Social Welfare this country has ever had. She doesn't even begin to understand what the welfare state was about. Well, I mean, the welfare state was always designed as a safety net. Yes. And this last government turned it into a trampoline. That's right. I mean, it was, a, it was a, um, what do they say, a, a hand up rather than a hand out. Mm. And- I mean, you made the comment earlier that we're creating a society where people expect the government to solve all of their problems, and that comes back to welfareism in a large, mm. in the way that it's been extended and extended and extended. I mean, working for families is a classic example. And John Key railed against it, said it was communism by stealth, And then when he was elected, not only did he keep it, he expanded it, you know, and and that's the thing is that people then, once they're getting something from the state, they expect that to come every week and it becomes a a death cycle for the taxpayer because there's less and less people inclined to become taxpayers and more and more people who become tax takers. Yep, absolutely. I mean, that was some of the reforms that you and Roger Douglas oversaw, was to recalibrate this so that working people uh, were rewarded for their hard work and effort, their now, their intellect and all of those sorts of things, rather than continuing you know, under the Muldoon regime where you had some people get, you know, paying 66 cents in the dollar yep. in taxation. Absolutely. Well, the trouble was it didn't last long. Moreover, we need to acknowledge that uh, it wasn't just ordinary folk who had their fists into the uh, till and were taking taxpayers' money. Farmers especially. Farmers and business people. I mean, remember all the the, um, import protections and uh, things that existed? And uh, it was a license to print money, especially in motor vehicles. If you could get the import license for something, um, yeah. you know, that was you know, waved across the desk of Robert Muldoon, you ended up um, having a license to print vast sums of money. Well, that, that was true right from the word go. And uh, the awarding of import licenses was something of a scandal. I was told once by somebody who was present. When Walter Nash was Prime Minister, Prime Minister, for God's sake, was still deciding on import licences. And uh, there was a, a, a meeting and the, all these things that had put in applications for licences. And uh, Walter would say, no, no, no. And then there came um, tinned Canadian salmon. And Walter said, no, hang on a minute, minister, says one of the officials. Lots of working folk rather treat tinned Canadian salmon as a special treat at the weekend. Oh, said Walter. Oh, oh, well, OK, we'll allow a certain amount to come in. So indeed they did. Uh, and I mean, that was the scientific uh, nature of import controls. They were chaotic. Moreover, uh, some of it was um, it was one of the few examples of uh, corruption. I had a relative who made elements uh, for mm. uh, water heaters and so on. Oh yeah, and he used to have to get import licenses, and they all tracked down to Wellington regularly to see the Industries and Commerce Department to make applications. And my uncle made inquiries of a friend. How did you go about things? Oh, well, if you see Bert, somebody or other, if Bert's the official you see, this is the technique. You'll make your case to him. He'll then say, excuse me, I've got to nip out the back to the toilet. 
you'll discover that his top drawer of his desk is slightly open. If you drop a 10 pound note in there, you'll get your license. And my uncle said, indeed. He discovered uh, that Bert had his drawer open a little bit. And he thought, well, why is everybody else getting licenses and I'm not? So he dropped his 10 pound note in. And I mean, scarcely a prince's ransom. You wouldn't call it corruption on a grand scale, except that that official clearly was doing quite well out of uh, mm. a government regulation. Yeah, I mean, the people have you know long said that there's no corruption in New Zealand, and and I've always said every time the Transparency International report comes out, well, these guys running around with blindfolds on. <laughs> well, like, think- there's so much corruption, it, it, particularly at local government level. I mean, there was a famous case where a lot of the footpath contracts and things like that were going to this little flea outfit um, that suddenly became a multi-million dollar turnover company, all off the basis of fixing footpaths in Auckland. Well, the only case I ever saw when I was actually a, a city councillor which I was in the early 70s, involved uh, the only corruption involved contracts. And we formed the impression, the works committee, that uh, the particular engineer that had signed off the awards of contracts was a bit corrupt and he didn't stick around much longer. His position was made too hot to handle and uh, he cleared off. But I wondered sometimes as to whether uh, the works area is an area where corruption still exists. Oh, look, I, I know some good examples. Personally, having been involved in tendering for some contracts, particularly in defence, and that is absolutely rife with, you know, you, the only word you can use is to call it corruption, but nobody ever seems to do anything about it. But there's these cosy contracts that keep getting let to, you know, guys who, you know, were never any great shake as an officer in the in the military and now have, have resigned uh, their commissions, gone out on their own, have obtained, you know, their exclusive rights to a particular product or something like that, and all of a sudden that's what gets selected um, all the time. It's like this cosy little arrangement. It's all right, you can go out into the private sector, but we'll look after you by ordering all of your products. Well, maybe, uh, but remember, New Zealand is a tiny society. Mm. When it comes to finding people who will contract to do things, it's quite difficult sometimes. I mean, uh, councillors, I remember the uh, uh, councillors when I was on the works committee saying, well, who are you going to get to do this job that we had that we wanted done? And the truth was that contractors weren't running around barefoot and uh, sometimes a little bit of corruption uh, crept in in order to get a job done. But when I say New Zealand is a little society, I think everything is little. You've cited some examples. I've cited some examples. But it's small ca- scale stuff compared with overseas corruption. Oh yeah, it's it's not Very it's not in, it's not endemic and it's isolated, but it it's particularly lucrative for those involved. But you're right about New Zealand being a small society, and New Zealanders, even though they travel overseas, it's like they travel overseas with blinkers on, and they don't see that New Zealand is a total of a population of around 5 million people. Even if you add the, the the those who are New Zealanders but live overseas, which is thought to be another 1.5 million people, even at 6.5 million people, that's the size of an Australian city, you know, yeah. Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah. Um, and, and Brisbane's approaching, I think Brisbane's approaching 5 million as well. Mm. So we are tiny but we like to think we're bigger than we are. And we're like trying to live a first world lifestyle with really a second world income and in some respects, a third world income. Um, and, and a fourth world income uh, approach to uh, working. Uh, I mean, if uh, if ever there's an opportunity not to work, uh, you can count on Kiwis putting their hands forward. Yeah, I mean, 
We look at some of these roading projects, so they're a glaring example because, and also the rail projects, they're eye watering sums of money that cannot be sustained by the population of New Zealand in total, and much less just Auckland City. But they they seem to be these gilt edged projects that are mega billions of dollars and uh, no prospect of ever to returning anything to the ratepayers or the taxpayers who have to fund these massive boondoggles. Just on that count, the number of jobs that have been finished within the contracted amount could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Take Auckland, the city rail link, which has now almost ruined a sizable chunk of uh, the city just slightly west of Queen Street. And uh, when it was first mooted as a Len Brown project, it was $2.8 billion. By the time they got round to signing the contract, it was $4.4 billion. And uh, last sign of accounts, it was $5.6 billion. And it'll be well over $6 billion by the time it's finished. Now, what on earth has gone wrong? I mean, how how can a country like New Zealand operate successfully if it can't calculate its infrastructure costings properly? There's any number of of projects that you can look at that. Uh, you know, again, a Len Brown mm-hmm. one, the whitewater rafting and canoe centre at Manukau, build it and they'll come. You know, they didn't. <laughs> Nobody's come. It's it, you can drive past there on any day of the week and you won't see anybody there. You could fire a shotgun across the water and not hit a single thing. It's insane. We had Michael Wood, you know, the Labour uh, oh. Transport Minister, proposing oh. a cycle bridge that was going to cost as much as a replacement for for the Harbour Bridge. They were going to build it beside. Oh. It was insane. They spent something like twenty five million dollars scoping it. Like, how on earth do you get to those sorts of money? Uh, you, you take the Northern Busway extension from Constellation to Otiha Valley. It's a distance of three and a half kilometres. It took seven years to build it. It's five lanes on either side. But what's ridiculous, at either end of that five lanes on either side, it's two lanes on either side. So you, all they succeeded in doing is moving the traffic jam from Otiha to Constellation, 3.5 kilometres closer to the city. You're quite right. I drove it just the other day, and uh, it, it's bizarre. You come sweeping down the new piece, and then you get near to Constellation Drive, and it all fouls up because cars are f- fluffing in from the left uh, off Constellation Drive, and um, uh, everything is blocked then until Milford. Yeah, it, it, it is totally an appalling design. They go from five lanes to two lanes, and it's the same the other way around. For the, all those heading home to Whangapraa um, each night, they, they get to Constellation, they spread out across five lanes, and then they're back into two at Otiha and crawling all the way to Silverdale. Just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but it cost moonbeams to do it. It's a good idea. I mean, the, the busway is a brilliant idea. I, I'll support busways all day long over and above trains because as soon as you get something happen with a train line, that's it. The, the whole system's closed down because nothing can move. Bus, At least with buses, bus, they can drive on a side road. It's much more manoeuvrable, yes. I mean, yeah. that's the problem with trains. And yet Michael Wood, that same uh, uh, sainted Michael Wood, was going to give us a $30 billion um, centre of the city to the airport light rail. No, but it wasn't going to go to the – this is the big lie that he told, right? It was never going to go to the airport. It was only going to go to Mangere Town Centre, and then you caught a bus from there to the airport. Well, I That's how insane it was. I hadn't picked up on that. But, of course, its, its origin was so suspicious – I mean, by the time Len Brown had done the CRL and Phil Goff had narrowed Queen Street to nothing so that there's a whole lot of uh, shops on either side of Queen Street with four lease signs in them and there was nothing really substantial left in the centre of the city, Michael Wood was going to funnel this uh, rail link in. I mean, just bizarre. No thinking 
no sort of lateral thinking. The best idea for uh, rail to the airport, I mean, it's a silly idea at the best of times, mm. but the best idea was, you know, ironically, from, from a left-leaning councillor who said that they should put a spur off Puanui and head to the airport. That way it's very short. It was rural land all the way through, apart from a little bit at Manukau, and that would solve the problem for a fraction of the cost. And, of course, he was howled down and told he was stupid and didn't know what he was talking about. But, you know, Mike Lee actually had a very good idea, and it's a shame it's never been picked up. You know, it, it, would, be, it would have been more. He's had a lot of good ideas in the course of his life. Uh, yes, some I don't agree with. but uh... Sure, but, you know, that's the thing about Mike Lee is that it doesn't, this is the problem with the polarisation in politics. Just because somebody from another team has a good idea doesn't mean you should howl it down. It Sometimes they should be investigated, and Mike Lee's one of those people who yeah. actually thinks logically in, about these things and says, well, this is ridiculous spending this, much, this amount of billions of dollars wrecking the communities between the city and only hunger, and then from then on. He's saying, no, let's go out. We've already got a rail line that get, goes through Puanui. Put a spur off that. There's only about 200 houses that we need to bowl to, to make that happen, and then the rest of it's all rural land in a straight line directly to the airport. You know, well, I always, I've always thought that a couple of hundred more of those little vans with a trailer hooked on behind that goes to your house and picks you up and uh, trundles you off to the airport for a fee would have solved the problem anyway. And it sure as hell wouldn't have cost $29 billion. Even if, and if you wanted to have a dedicated method of transport, to those areas, then allow those vans to go on a busway that you've built yeah. to go to the airport. Yes. You know, uh, yes, certainly. Well, so they should go on a busway, mm. just to, just as I think Ubers ought to be allowed to go on um, busways if taxis can. Let's just get back to Luxon. You've said that it appears that he's short of solutions as well. I've picked that up as well, and. It seems that National's been caught flat-footed on some policy areas, particularly in transport with the announcements on uh, Monday of this week, where they're going to hike particular rates and you know, road user charges and things, but they're going to wait till the second term to do that. Oh, that's because of, uh, because of the promise that was yes. made, uh, that in effect, that we won't do this in the first term. And uh, they didn't qualify it that way. But, of course, when it comes to the second term, uh, you deal with that when that election uh, time comes around. Mm. Um, that's why they've done that, I'm sure. But um, the essential point, though, which, again, they can't explain properly, but which is understandable, the user should pay. Mm. Uh, there's no reason why my aged aunt, who um, uh, doesn't go anywhere much except in her little flivver, should have to pay huge sums for uh, bus transport if she never uses a bus, mm. or um, vice versa, the bus user should pay the petrol tax when they never uh, drive a car. Uh, I mean, a user pays is how it should be. And I think that's what the government is reaching towards. I don't think they're going far enough, though. We've got all these Probably cycleways, not. and the user doesn't pay for the well, cycleways. Oh, I agree. I mean, I'm stunned that they've only cut that in half. Uh, why? Um, I mean, the cycleway stuff. I mean, for a kickoff, most cyclists don't adhere to uh, the cycleway policy. They'll drive on the road. Go along Ponsonby Road, and how many times do you have to uh, um, uh, just about bounce a bicycle uh, because they're not on the... Uh... Well, interestingly, I was driving down Ponsonby Road yesterday. I didn't see a cyclist at all, and that's the thing with these cycleways. You never see any cyclists on them. No, no. Uh, I go every every. Yeah, every Monday I go out to Manukau for lunch with my mates. I drive down Cavendish Drive, which has got a cycleway built into the side of it. Never seen a cyclist on it, not once. Well, take the waterfront drive where they've uh, done an elaborate cycle lane thing 
And I've several times uh, recently encountered a cyclist on the main drag, on the main tarmac. Yeah, and the, the, the thing is with cyclists, um, they've got their little helpers in the media, people like Russell Brown and Simon uh, Wilson, oh, okay. and they scream blue murder if a single millimetre of cycleway is removed. They're almost more entitled than MPs are for entitlements. Yes, yes, and yet they don't pay a bean, except no. through their rates in as much as they pay rates. Yeah. And of course, everybody pays rates because they pay them even through their uh, rents if they're renting. So what do you think Luxon needs to do? I mean, my, I've often said when taking office in the first 100 days, literally like perhaps in the first week, they need to line up all the heads of departments on the front steps of Parliament and metaphorically shoot one of them in the back of the head and then say to the others, now let, let, that, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> Well, uh, they certainly need to be told. Uh, Kirk did that in 1972 when I was first elected. Uh, Kirk was sworn into office as prime minister and uh, he summoned all the um, heads of the departments around and uh, showed them the Labour Party's manifesto, this red glossy thing, and patted mm. it and said, this is what we're going to do and uh, this is what you're going to be asked to do and um, uh, follow the um, bureaucratic rules and do it. So that was as good as a, what you've just suggested. It didn't involve shooting anybody, but... <laughs> I'm not suggesting we <laughs> shoot anybody, but you, you know what I mean. Is I pick, a, pick a senior civil servant, someone yeah. who's, who's a bit mouthy and has commented on things, and get rid of them. And then say to the rest, if you don't follow our instructions... That's going to happen to you. Well, several should have been uh, pushed out. I mean, the head of social welfare, the head of education. Police. Police. Health, of course, has been subjected to so much chaotic stuff, rather hard to find out who it would be that you'd be getting rid of. But uh, there should have been substantial offers of resignations. But uh, ministers, they're not a particularly strong set, I have to say. I don't think the Minister of Education is great. I think the Minister of Health is good, uh, showing some real class, because he knows... Well, he knows a few, few, a few things knows. about it. <laughs> he does. But coming back to the Prime Minister, the first thing is you need excellent people in your office. And judging by the quality of the press statements and the speeches that have been given so far, they haven't yet found the best person. If a prime minister, even a new chum, has a good speechwriter, he or she can uh, be a hell of a lot better than otherwise they might seem. I don't know if you've ever watched the original Office um, TV program with Ricky Gervais in it. And he has a, he portrays a character called David Brent, who who um, sits there and intones his knowledge of management and you know human resources and all that. And he's singularly hopeless at everything. I get the distinct impression that Christopher Luxon has studied at the right hand of David Brent and is exhibiting a lot of Brent-like characteristics. And it doesn't fill me with any confidence. Well, I, I haven't seen that program and uh, I don't uh, know it, but uh, he certainly needs a better office staff than he's got. And I think it's very important that he has some people around who are old hands and who can point to the dangers of things. I mean, a prime minister gets caught on the hop. It's in the nature of the job. Something suddenly blows out in left field. Mm. You haven't been schooled up on it. And you need somebody who's an old hand and who can say, oh, well, I wouldn't say too much about that just yet. Uh, there are two sides to that story. And so you, instead of wading in and making a statement that you'll do this or do that or um, you, you, uh, you hold off until you've gotten yourself properly briefed. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, there's been a huge hiring frenzy and swapping out staff. Uh, 
you know, since the change of government. But I've noticed a, a lot of familiar names turning up and, you know, they're less than average journalists who are now uh, sitting there in ministers' offices churning out press releases. And I'm thinking, what were you thinking hiring that person? Did, did you not read all of the things that they wrote about you when you were in opposition? Almost certainly not. Yeah. It's nuts, and there's no sort of like there's no Heather Simpson type person no. uh, in the government that all of the staff and the ministers quiver in fear at seeing that number pop up on their phone, you know, and you're getting a summons to that office. You, no, no good is ever going to come of that summons, and so you, you quiver in fear. There doesn't seem to be anybody like that in the in the Luxon led government. Well, too many of the ministers are quite new to Parliament. I mean, the Minister of Māori Affairs has only been there for five seconds uh, in Parliament, won a by-election in 2022, I think, didn't he? And yeah. um, uh, the uh, Minister of Education has not been there very long. Paul Goldsmith's one of the longest-serving uh, um, ministers. He'd done a little bit between 2014 and 2017, enough to uh, sort of have a bit of a handle on uh, some of the people, but too many of the other ministers just are quite new chums. Yeah, and Mark Mitchell's had a bit of experience, and I, I understand, not from Mark Mitchell himself, but from people that are close to what's going on there, that there's been a bit of a Donnybrook between him and the police commissioner over uh, all of these sort of ESG-type woke jobs that the police have created and the minister has said, we'll get rid of them. We don't need that. We need people on the street. And there's been quite a Donnybrook around that. But I'm not sure how Costa thinks he's going to win against the minister. Well, his Costa's uh, term, his five-year term, comes up next year, I think, doesn't it? And I'd be very surprised if he's um, uh, reappointed. Yeah, I think the government is missing you know, a Heather Simpson-type person or, or from the TV yeah. show, the thick of it, a, a, a Malcolm Tucker type um, character. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It's a, a Br yeah. British comedy show and Peter Capaldi with his broad Scottish accent plays Malcolm Tucker, who's the enforcer of the government. Um, there's some just brilliant lines from there, but there doesn't seem to be anybody in the government that's doing that. No. Uh, no, no, but, no toughies. Well, you know, we, we, we voted for a change of government. Anything's better than the Ardern Hipkins regime. <laughs> But but you and I are perfectionists, and um, we like to see even people that ostensibly are our team to do better than they're currently doing. And and that's the I get the tone of your article was about that that you were disappointed that they haven't done better. Yes, well, I mean, I don't remember. I don't come from a national party background, no. or I made no secret of having voted for ACT uh, this last time. Mm. Uh, but I just don't think that this government looks to be any better than most of the other national governments uh, uh, that promised the earth and did precious little. And um, uh, I mean, John Key's government was a terrible disappointment. They were going to uh, uh, get us uh, an economy the equivalent of Australia. And uh, when they get a template put in front of them about how they might go about this, they backed off immediately. And um, it was the same with Sid Holland's government, the same with Keith Holyoaks. The National Party is always the government of the status quo. I've been saying that for, for years and years and years. It's why I'm no longer a member of the National Party, apart from the fact they didn't want me, because I kept pointing at them and saying, you're just the government of the status quo. All you do is manage Labor's reforms. Well, that's that's absolutely right, and uh, uh, that's more or less the thrust of my book uh, on the state in New Zealand. <laughs> It's a terrible state, and we're not going to get ahead until politicians get brave. But MMP do doesn't reward bravery, sadly. No, no. In fact, it rewards uh, people that want to uh, slide off and uh, do their own thing. And that makes life more difficult, piecing a coalition together. MMP forces mediocrity and indolence on parliamentarians. Yes, I agree. <laughs> you and I should start a campaign uh, against MMP. I think it's. Uh, it, I didn't support it at the time. I thought it was nuts, and it's proved to be nuts. 
but we can't get rid of it because every time we try and get rid of it, the incumbent prime minister screws the scrum and loads it up with lots of other choices and everyone gets around arguing about the merits of this or that and that and that and all these other things and they don't actually vote to get rid of it and it wins by being mm. the status quo. Yeah. John Key did exactly that. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. He was a disappointment as a prime minister, someone with so much uh, ability and it, his government existed uh, so that he could get a knighthood and um, that's about the size of it. Yeah, well, not not as successful as it could have been, yeah. uh, which is a great uh, pity. All right, my friend. All right. Well, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground there, Michael. A pleasure, as always, having you on The Crunch, and uh, we'll get you back again whenever something historic or momentous arises and we need your <laughs> sage wisdom. Well, happy to chat. And the best of luck with your life in the next in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. I think Michael Bassett is a national treasure. He still thinks the Ardern Hipkins regime was the worst government in living memory, but he also singled out Carmel Cipollone for a special mention, and he didn't hold back. Let me know your thoughts about my chat with Michael Bassett by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. And now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we'll find out what they think about the collapse of News Hub and the media in general. I'm expecting this buddy session to be as brutal as it will be honest. My producer has them all lined up, ready to go. Let's go now to Cam's Buddies. Welcome back to Cam's Buddies, Lindley. Good to have you again. Oh, hi, Cam. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Fantastic. Hey, I've got an interesting topic for you tonight. Um, there's been a lot of wailing in the media about the collapse of News Hub, and oh. I wanted to ask your opinion on that and the general state of the media uh, in general. I'm sure you've got some very wise words to say to those wailing journalists. Well, I can't understand the wailing. But I've got two words for this. We can sum it up in two words. Contrived and gone. Yeah. And that and... absolutely sums it up. Because mainstream media is contrived. False. And many people are sick of it. And they've got new online choices now that they never had before. Yeah, they've got Reality Check Radio for a start. Indeed. And we can listen to... Very, very extensive interviews that are straight from the coalface, no interrupts from the interviewers, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So what do you reckon they can learn? I mean, or will they learn, or are they just slow learners? I don't think they can learn. Um, I mean, think of this. Cave walls, clay tablets, smoke signals, Morse code. With time, yes, things change, don't they? News How hub. come they never saw this coming? Well, I've been because saying it for years it's going to happen this way. It, lineal TV, uh, where we've all got to watch according to the schedule they decide for us, has been long dead. We consume our media in many, many different ways, often through iPads or through their computer. Um, you know, they've persisted in this outdated method of delivery of, of information. And it's often four or five days late anyway. Well, you're absolutely right. TV's dead in the water. And like you say, it has been for years. I mean, you could see the the um, dying spiral, you know. I can't understand how they never saw it because if they class themselves as journalists and some investigative journalists, they couldn't even investigate their own demise. And yet it was right in front of their eyes. And they've completely failed to adapt. If they had realised it, they could have thought of something innovative, you know, to take its place and take their viewers on, <coughs> viewers or listeners onto that. But they failed that, didn't they? And well, now they're shocked. That's what I can't get over. I think, do you know what I think is the most shocking thing of all? That they've got their hands the out that for they are shocked. <laughs> oh, it's just unbelievable. And, well, and it's ridiculous. I mean, honestly, I can't believe that they're 
overflated egos actually think that they have an amazing product. It's an awful product. And I used to watch it years ago, and I can no longer watch it. I turn it off. So I'm just an ordinary person, you know, that represents the average Joe Bloggs, really. Um, other people turn it off too. And, you know, the absolute inane hilarity in kindergarten style of delivery is beyond belief. Do they think that's viewable? It's like story time for children. Well, is it just they, me that think thinks they, that? No, I don't think it's just you that thinks that. And, and I think in increasing numbers, people have been turned off uh, both TVNZ and uh, News Hub for receiving their news. I mean, often stories that they run are four or five days old. Then they put a particular slant on it, and you think, well, hang on a second. I read that, uh, you know, somewhere else around the world four or five days ago, and that's not the impression I got from that story. And they've been pushing these well, agendas I mean, of to... various minor groups of people in New Zealand as though it's normal, you know, and it's not. I know, and I've got a beauty on that one. That this is this was actually the point that turned me around on the media, and they won't like to know that it involved Donald Trump. They won't like that. But um, I happen to be watching um, Fox, and uh, Trump came on, and as he often did, he whistled up to the um, journalists and had a chat straight off the cuff. And this is what he said. To some people, COVID is just a cold. To others, it is life-threatening. Now, the very next day, all over our news, in fact, all over the world news, it said, Trump says COVID is just a cold. Yeah. Now, that is not what he said. It is totally misrepresenting what he said. And it was accompanied with a photo of Trump looking as ridiculous as is possible. And this is how they shape our minds. So just from that one item, they persuade people to think Trump's an idiot, COVID is very serious, ooh, fear, and we must watch the next episode because it's like a soap opera. Well, they're just liars. They just lie through and through, and they have a format, which I'm sure you're aware of. So we sort of have the newsreader's headline, which captures our attention, and then we have a journalist lead-in, don't we, which sets our emotion for what's to follow. Yeah. And then we have the video, which shows the evidence, and that's often staged. And then the journalist closes, usually in a fairly fatalistic tone, and we suck up the whole item as fact. Well, the bad news for them is a lot of people have woken up to that now and they don't want to watch it. They don't want people telling lies to them. No, people have had enough and they've been saying it for a very long time. And these journalists and media people all turn around and say, oh, you know, trust is falling in the media. We need the government to do something about it. They never once stop to think that perhaps the trust in media falling is as a result of their dishonesty and their um, lack of integrity in the way they deal with things. They always say things like, oh, this journalist is a fantastic storyteller. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was a little kid <clears throat> and I was telling fibs to my father, he'd say to me, you're telling stories again, aren't you? You know, and, and that's, <laughs> yes. these journalists are all running around telling us that they tell great stories. Well, in my head, I just hear they tell great lies. Yes. Uh, well, you know, you and thousands of others. But, you know, you know how I love these little one-liners, don't you? I've got mm. one for that. Yeah. Thou shalt not bear false witness. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good, very good one-liner. But they've just yeah. ignored their audience. They've carried on uh, doing their activism because you can't call it journalism. And, no. And then they're all surprised when there aren't enough viewers to support their lavish lifestyles and um, uh, all of a sudden they've gone from hero to zero or rooster to feather duster. I know. And the incredible thing is they're not surprised, Cam. They're shocked, quote. Yeah. Yeah. They're shocked. I mean, I saw that man on... on um, he was crying. I think he's the head of the whole shebang. 
he was yeah. crying, and he said he was shocked. Shocked. Well, shocked. Yeah. Yeah. He was shocked, and he was crying. You know, is this? Well, I, I'm. I mean, I do feel sorry for the people that have lost their jobs, but hey, they never felt sorry for certain people that lost their jobs three or four years ago. No, they never did. You know, they 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 I have never... reported on misery and human suffering with gay abandon, and then they're cons- you know shocked, as you say, shocked that the audience yeah. has disappeared on them. You know, and we're all sitting here snickering yeah. and laughing at them. I just think it's just incredible. And, I mean, one of the most amazing things in recent times was Winston Peters, who, who they bag, you know, at every opportunity. And when he called them out on the government funding thing, they disgracefully lied. And I've seen a copy of the funding document, and it states that they must promote colonisation and its negative effect on Maoris. They must promote climate change. And if they don't, their funding will be called back in again. Yeah, it's clear and in black they and stood white. Up there in res- yeah, they stood up there um, in response to Winston Peters calling them out, and they said there was no government influence. He was a liar. Yeah, but that's right. But people are waking up to this. Well, they're going to be waking up you to, know, to not having um, these uh, fools gaslighting us, and, and, and that's really what News Hub were. They were an organisation that gaslit us, especially during the COVID years. They were the, you know, Ardern's happy little minstrels um, that were gleefully singing along. We had little Tova there, always got the first questions, and if it wasn't Tova, it was Jessica. It was so yeah. blatant, <laughs> you know, so blatant, and then they sit there and go, what happened? Yeah, well, like I said, really, the one word for them is contrived right the way through, even for that. And I'll tell you what, if people are listening at the moment, if they don't believe us, um, I challenge anyone to get on any MSM in New Zealand at the moment and to openly express their concerns about, say, the COVID vax and the possible side effects of myocarditis, etc. They'll never get on. Because the... The result will be either they'll be totally discredited or they'll be cut off. Yeah. You know? And you've so, got other so radio the, hosts who call anybody with with the views that we have cookers and abuse us and, and things like that. You know, he's just... I know, they are viciously, one, viciously one-eyed, they are. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just can't watch it. I Like, if there's uh, sort of a, an event, maybe there's a um, forest fire heading towards my house or something, I, I might switch it on to have, a you know, an update. But even then, I have found a Christchurch source of news, Chris, Chris Lynch News, yep. Yep. Um, and people have taken to watching that because it's just news. It's just authentic. It's not grooming our minds for political agenda. Well, the other thing too And I think that's what... If you look at Reality Check Radio, we we interview all sorts of people. Now, we don't necessarily agree with their point of view. I certainly don't agree with the majority of, of of the guests that I have on my show, but we let them speak and we let them talk and we let them answer questions and we don't shut them off and machine gun them with a hidden agenda of trying to make um, the politician or, or, or indeed any guest just to destroy them. We're there to listen to what they've got to say, and it's the job of the host to ask sensible, pertinent questions that will get more information to the listeners. Well, that's exactly what it is, and that's why people enjoy it. Um, and I do. I mean, I've got past children's stories, and um, I actually want to hear something fairly extensive Um and highly detailed, and that's what I get out of it. And they seem to always have people right from the coalface. It's you know, there's no person in between. We're talking to the actual person um, concerned with the event or whatever it is, and that's what I really appreciate. And then I can sit back and make up my own mind, um, you know, what I think of them, and, and form my own opinion. I'm not having my opinion formed for me. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that's... people don't understand the dishonesty that occurs in the mainstream media. I'll give you a good example, and it involves me. There was an article two weeks ago about me. It was published at 12.28 p.m., you know, just after lunch. 
And 10 minutes later, I got an email from the journalist asking me for comment on the story they're about to publish, which was already published. And in the bottom line of the article, they say, we've approached Mr. Slater for comment. All right, so they're, they're, they're <laughs> yeah. deceiving their readers that these people have contacted me before they published the article, and they didn't. Yes. And I can prove it, and they've done it time and time and time again. They're just dishonest, and they, and they but do sit you think, there. Do you think that they're capable of learning that that's not wise? It would appear not. No. And, and that's the problem is they don't learn, so they then, you know, it's like if you've got a naughty kid, back in the day you used to give them a, a pat on the back low enough and hard enough and it straightened them out. There's no <laughs> consequences for anything now. There's no consequences for bad behaviour. And so people don't learn those lessons and they keep on perpetuating the issues that the, 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 the things that the mistakes that they keep making because they've never been punished for them or never had a consequence for them. That's correct. And of course, the other consequence they don't get in this case is the budget. You know, if you were running, um, I don't know, a podcast or something and you started to run out of money, you sort of look at how you can uh, improve your act. You don't run out and, and fill up 10 credit cards and keep going. Um, they, they just keep going. I mean, if you look at the losses that they have chalked up, it's absolutely massive, but they've kept on going. So somebody has been financially supporting them, even though their product is not wanted. Exactly. Well, that's no consequences. No, no consequence at all. Well, I better go to Paul. He's waiting on the lines, but thank you very much for, for your contribution there, Lindley, and um, I'll talk to you again next week. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Paul. How are you? Very good, thank you. How are yourself? Yeah, box of box of uh, fluffies. Actually, it's uh, you know Thursday afternoon, and and uh, I'm enjoying the radio show, and we've got a good topic to talk about. And I've just had Lindley on, and um, she was scathing of the media, and uh, the the topic was, uh, what do you think of the failure of News Hub and the media in general? Um. <clears throat> I think that's um, a great question, and I'm really disappointed at the failure of the News Hub because it's representative of 300 families who are, I guess, stressed and concerned and worried about what's going to happen, and that means there's a flood of such people on the market. So if there happens to be any other jobs that arise from this, they'll they'll know that they have their friends and colleagues as applicants Mm. and so you'll be competing against each other for what little crumbs there are left and I'm thinking that must be a terrible situation to be in. Having said that, go woke, go broke. I think there's, we we are not in any doubt as to what happened and why um, people are less interested in watching what they're watching in, in that and people don't necessarily get their news from television anymore because they seem to be, in my view, during the pandemic, mouthpieces for propaganda. And they were happy, any time I listened, if something came on about Donald Trump, they had a scathing way that they talked of him. Mm. And they never talked such of Joe Biden, who is, in my view, senile. Yeah. And then whenever they're talking to someone about something that I think is, is, um, is it a boy, is it a girl, who knows, they report in, in the manner that they believe you're supposed to report rather than saying, well, he, he's having a baby. Um, oh, no, he's not. She's having a baby. Or <laughs> that all this sort of unusual behaviour so that we don't know if we're Arthur or Martha leads people into trusting them less. Now, for some reason, they think we all believe this. Most people I speak to don't believe such things. Now, I might live in a, a very um, circle of people who think like me, but I don't believe so. I, I go to a number of places where I'm the only white face. Yeah. And when we're having discussions about different things, they all seem to be on the same page as, as me regarding many of the subjects that we talk about. But another thing that I think is very interesting is to make that news show go and News Hub go and all that they do, 300 staff. Yeah. If you want to look at what will kill any business, it's an over... In, like, how, how many 
hours of production did they produce per day for 300 staff? I watch Avi Yimini, and he can actually produce um, good content every day with himself as a security guard and a cameraman. Yep. And so I'm thinking, well, that's three people, so they'd have to do 100 times more work than Avi to be earning what they're earning. And um, I don't believe they do. I, don't, I think Avi's probably not too dissimilar in output to them in total. <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking, I'm thinking, many of the things that they do look like they were going to perhaps struggle. Now, what would I know about business, although I've had a few, and I know that in any, um, what is it, the Pareto principle that... Um, yeah, the 80-20 rule. Uh, what is it? I think, yeah, twenty percent of the people do eighty percent of the work. Or if you can, I think it's down to the the um, square root of the staff do ninety percent of the work. Yeah. So any time you look at a business, and, and Elon Musk is a, must be a great believer in it because he sacks everybody that's there. They say it's never going to work, and suddenly it's going as good as ever with a tenth of staff. So he must have something right. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. The media have sat there moribund, uh, not changing, blaming the audience, blaming everything else uh, as trust has been evaporating before their eyes. And uh, they've been continued to gaslight us on almost anything, like you say about, um, you know, whether a, a man can have a baby or um, a man can chest feed or any of this sort of nonsense. They gaslight yeah. us on that. They gaslit us about vaccines. They gaslit us about uh, uh, safe and effective, and they wonder why we don't trust them. It, it, it's not a surprise. It, it's a surprise to them, I know, but that's probably because they have their head up their own fundament for most of the time. Well, I, I found it most interesting. Any any interaction I've had with the media, they have completely misrepresented me. And I mean, you couldn't get more of a misrepresentation. They said that I was a leader of a particular organization. I'm not even a member of the organization. Mm. They said at different times that I'm helping this person for the good of myself. And trust me, they were a drain on me and my resources. I was helping them for the good of them because I saw a need. And, and mm. when things make the paper that are just absolutely challenging of a good deed, and, and I know no good deed will go unpunished, I know that, but I look and I think when media are seeing someone who's got a, a mental health issue and what they do is make it so anybody trying to help them becomes a villain, then I'm thinking, well, maybe they aren't such nice people. And I talked to another friend who said, oh, as soon as you've got this or this or this reporter on your case, they're ruthless, they lie, they edit what you say, so you, you almost need to take a video of it yourself. And I see um, different people who, when um, I think it was the BBC, were trying to attack Tommy Robinson and they were trying to get people to talk against him. And he videoed them being deceptive and completely lying. And I'm thinking, this is wow stuff. And the public want to believe that the news media are telling you what happened. I'm not as interested in opinion pieces. I'm more interested in what happened rather than what you think what happened means. So if you tell me what happened, I can draw my own conclusions. I have a reasonable intellect and you tell me what happened and I can draw my own conclusions. Mm. If you tell me what your slant is, then I'm thinking, well, this is crap. I'm not interested in your slant. What what actually happened? Yeah, I mean, that's so what sometimes... Called. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes these folk, they become the master of their own undoing. And if they've all been to the same university and got their media training so that this is how it is now, then it's not even necessarily their fault, but they've been manipulated as like the um, useful idiots that they are often because they've been doing the bidding of whoever trained the university people to train them in such nonsense. So I just look and I think, whilst there's 300 families 
and, and if, if any of them are the patriarch of their family, sometimes you have other families hanging on your success. So mm. it could be even a thousand families that have actually got to suffer after June because of what has happened. And I'm, I'm sad about that. But also, the people that are in the industry that are doing this that are going to lose their jobs, I see a number of them thinking that they might put a, a, um, a thing to Discovery or Disney or whoever it is and say, what about we take it over ourselves? Well, I would suggest to you they're not business people. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been reporting um, opinion pieces. And the business of business sometimes um, is much harsher in the reality than, than most people think. There's a lot of people at the grassroots level thinking, well, if you do this and this and this, it will work. Well, trust me, other people with greater minds than these have thought of it, and it's not working. So at the end of the day, you look at them and you think, if you want to chuck whatever your asset base is away, then take it on yourself and see if you can have a go. I mean, the, to my mind, a media uh, organization's greatest asset is trust, and it is something that should be guarded. It should something that should be cherished. But when it's gone, it's gone, and you can't get it back. And organisations like News Hub or the New Zealand Herald or Stuff have shown us that they can't be trusted. I mean, Stuff has has an editorial policy of not running any information that's contrary to the climate change narrative that's all agreed to by you know the WEF and everybody else. That's the editorial policy, and they'll be the next organisation that tips over because they've just got an inherent bias and an inherent dishonesty in everything they do. And the same goes for the New Zealand Herald. You know, um, I've got a, a real beef with a couple of journalists, uh, if you can call them that, at the New Zealand Herald, but it's because of their dishonesty. Well, I think that it ends up playing out over and over again. Like when people have lost their trust. Nothing that, like, like um, I was talking to someone recently who was saying that there's likely to be a measles epidemic in the Western world because of the lies that were told about the vaccine that was the um, COVID vaccine. Now people are thinking, well, I'm not taking any vaccine. And, and we all know that vaccines are great and good. And, well, well I, I know in my family we took these um, measles and rubella and mumps and all that sort of thing. And I know there was a lot of people against it at the time. And uh, many of the diseases of the past have kind of gone away. But this is likely to bring them back because of the lack of trust. And I think the media are complicit in this. And as for companies saying that they can't discuss the other side of an agreement because that's their policy now, the science is settled. That is so not scientific. It's, it's laughable if it wasn't actually so, so sad. But the danger of not allowing free speech, when you don't allow free speech, people die. And the reason I say that is we all have a, someone saying, I've got an idea in our minds. Let's run down the motorway at a, a hundred... Um, or 160 kilometres an hour. And then the sensible guy in your mind says, don't do that, you'll get a ticket, or don't do that, you'll kill yourself. And eventually you work through all decisions that you make with these pros and cons of someone chatting in your mind, yep. and you kill the one with the bad idea, and you do the good idea. And that person, that, 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 that thought that was in your mind is gone. Well, if you can't criticise ideas and have the ideas getting challenged then instead of killing the idea off, people will lose their lives because of it, because of the lack of free speech. And my belief is more people die of the cold than of the heat in the world, and yep. no one's saying that. And no one's talking... But whilst they're talking about the climate change narrative and stuff, is, I know that they've um, said that they're not allowed... The science has settled, so they won't ever publish an editorial to the other side of the equation... Mm. While they're talking about that nonsense, they're not bringing in human flourishing. So they're not bringing in, if you take away the um, greenhouse gases and this, like all the fossil fuels and this, then no one can heat their homes and they die. They're not, they're not challenging that. And they're not challenging the fact that um, even now in the UK, people are of an opinion that they, um, their heating is so expensive 
they're, they're not turning it on and people are dying because of it. I mean, it, 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 it's actually gaslighting and it's dishonest. I mean, the, the whole statement about, um, you know, the science is settled just is not how science works. There is no science that's settled. That's settled. You have theories and you test those theories until you either prove that the theory holds or you disprove it by something else happening. There's almost nothing that's actually proved in science. But they did that, and they did that with the vaccine well, the laws, too, safe and effective. You know, it was a lie, um, and they just pushed that yeah. lie constantly. And you wouldn't hear um, anybody say anything different because they wouldn't allow it. Well, it's like the laws. Laws of gravity exist because, and they call them a law because it's happened a million times plus. So that, but but the, everything else, like the theory of. Pythagoras, or the theorem of Pythagoras. Now, that works every time as well, but it's not as graphic as a law. So we know science doesn't say the science is settled. Otherwise, everything would be a law instead of a theory. And when the, when the theory no longer holds, it's not a theory anymore. That's right. And once it's a, not a theory, it's a law. But it's a law because it's been proven. There's not a single law about climate change. Not, not one. And, and all of the all of the thousands of predictions of calamity that they've uh, to, you know said were going to happen, like uh, I think Al Gore said that the the um, North Pole would be ice free by 2012, and here we are uh, in 2024, and there's still a whole pile of ice up there, you know. So when does somebody exactly. say Al Gore is a liar? Well, on YouTube, there's a number of things, and I know YouTube isn't the gospel, but on YouTube, there's a number of things you can look up all the predictions that haven't come true around climate change, and there's a vast number of them with where, where people have predicted this will happen by then, and the science says it. Turns out, not true. Yeah, exactly. I've got uh, got somebody else uh, waiting in the queue, uh, Paul, so I'm going to have to call the the call short now, and um, we'll talk again next week. Okay, take care. Bye for now. Thank you. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jack. Hello, Cam. Sorry, I was late. I was waiting for Paul. Yeah, well, you know, I had to push him off um, so I could get to your call because, you know, it's far more important. Whatever. <laughs> hey, uh, the topic for discussion tonight is the failure of News Hub. Is it bad? Is it good? Is it indifferent? And what do you think the media should be doing or what do you think the prospects for the mainstream media are? Well, firstly, the minute I heard the news, I started watching TV3. I should have been doing it ages ago. I feel really guilty. But the reason why, and I'm sure unlike a lot of other people, we stayed on TV1, even though it's nowhere near as good, purely because of the chase. I'm a chase fanatic. And then we sit there in our lazy boy listening to the chase, and immediately that finishes, the news starts to go, oh, well, that's it. I'll just keep listening or watching. So you're saying it's inertia that people of your advanced ages don't change the channel, and that's why TV3 is folded. <laughs> I can't say that's the total reason, um, but it's the reason why I never changed, and I can only mm, make an assumption that others may have felt the same. But well, I know as I said before, I, the minute I knew they were... Yeah. Go ahead. No, well, it's like that in radio. Right? There's, if, you know, News Talk ZB has a massive audience, and that's a legacy from when the, when the state-owned those um, audiences or, or those stations. They had one ZB, two ZB, all of those. Well, they all got amalgamated into News Talk ZB. It became a private organisation, but nobody changed the dial. And so when MediaWorks started up Radio Live and then Today FM and you know, Magic or whatever, all of the three that they've started that ultimately failed, they failed because of inertia yep. in some respect, but also because they were a poor facsimile of what everyone was used to. And as a consequence, uh, there was no movement of viewership. Now, I can remember sitting in the lounge of mum and dad's place when TV3 started. We were all there to watch TV3 start with the you know, little logo and everything coming up on the screen. I remember that, uh, those days. But they haven't really progressed. I mean, I don't think they've ever made a profit. Now, I don't know about you, but... There's not many businesses, if you don't make a profit, you can continue on for 30-odd years. Tell me about it. Yeah, I think um, um, there's so many options now. A lot of people, the young people in particular, watch everything on their I don't know, phone, pad, or whatever. 
and uh, less people are actually watching TV. I think it's yeah, us I mean, oldies I, that are, are adherents of it. Yeah, well, I, I do tend not to watch what I, what's called lineal TV, where, you, you know, you, you start at the news at 6 o'clock and then something else at 7 and then something else after that and something else after that. I consume my television in bite-sized chunks. I usually watch two or three episodes of a series that I'm enjoying and um, I t- turn the television off for the rest unless I'm watching cricket or um, some sort of sport or something like that. But I don't consume the news uh, because, frankly, it's not news. It's uh, propaganda, as Paul said, and it's often f- you know four or five days after the fact when I actually read the news somewhere else. And uh, they don't cater to, to the audience. I, sometimes I wonder whether I'm going mad. I go, I've heard that. Where did I hear that? And then the next um, item comes on. Oh, man, I know about that. Jeez. And I'm thinking, where did I hear that? You're right. It's um, regurgitated over and over again. I mean, yeah. you, you think how bad it is for TV3. What about newspapers? Would you like to own the Herald newspaper chain right now? No, I not not. not not particularly. You know, it's a it's a, literally a sunset industry and the sun setting. And uh, these media yeah. types are all sitting there like this is a new revelation when we've actually known that this is the demise of this is going to happen for years. I mean, you know, you used to get uh, videos out from a video shop and then DVDs and then they're all gone. Well, why are they all gone? Because oh, yeah. it was a sunset industry that failed to adapt, and so. You know, Netflix and other streaming options came along. So we've got TV and Z sitting yep. there producing things in a lineal form. We've got News Hub producing things in a lineal form and TV3. And they're sitting there going, oh, but everybody gets their information elsewhere. Well, well why didn't you change? You know, it, why didn't uh. it's 10 years since I actually sat down with Mark Jennings in a in a meeting room and said, you know, unless you change, things are going to, uh, this is what's going to happen. And it, and that was, yeah, that was 2014. So it's 10 years ago that I sat down and warned him of that. And in the meantime, they've done literally nothing to mitigate uh, the loss or change or adapt the way that they uh, serve their customers. But 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 in the mm-hmm. way they serve and their all, customers, they gaslight us on everything. Yeah, we're all a lot lazier now. Um, I sit there in the chair thinking, oh, will I go to what's on the net, what's on next? I look at my iPad, look at Sky and say, oh, okay, nothing. Oh, I'll go to Netflix. Then my Apple Watch says, you've been sitting too long. Time to stand. Oh, and I go, oh, whereas before Netflix and so forth, I might have stood up, even if it was to put a video in the video player. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think you're right. We consume things differently, and these media companies haven't changed. You know, they, they just have not adapted fast enough, and they're literally like the buggy whip manufacturers clamoring for government support to maintain their business when everybody else is actually out there driving Fords, um, Model T Fords or something similar. Yep. We hate change, and i tell you what, another phenomenon. When I have an acquaintance around or two, and it comes 6 o'clock, next minute, we better watch the news. So then I go, oh, which news um, channel do you want? Oh, we watch one. So whatever I'm watching, we have to go to one. Now, it's not just one person that's done that. It's quite a lot of people. (laughs) I know. (laughs) I mean, honestly, come on, Jack, put your foot down. You know, no, we're watching my news and we're going to get it from here. It's your place. (laughs) Yeah, but the point I'm making is people hate change. Yeah, They get used to one thing. I can remember I was really looking forward to Paul Holmes starting on 1ZB, and I was there on day one Yeah, and thinking, what's this all about? And it became a phenomenon, this talkback radio thing. A huge and phenomenon. And progressed now you know. through to motor mouth. Yeah, well, now you're on a talkback show um, that I'm hosting. Exactly. <laughs> all right, Jack, thanks for your <laughs> contribution, and we'll talk again next week. Right, see you, Cam. Bye. Thanks, bye. Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. Good to have you back. G'day, Cameron. You good this week again? Always good, mate. And even if I'm not, I'll just lie to you. <laughs> now, what do you got for me this week, mate? There's a lot happening. Well, speaking of liars, you would have, you being a complete media junkie, uh, you would have uh, seen the news that uh, News Hub is closing down in June or July or something like that. Can't be soon enough. What are your thoughts on that? And uh, what do you think the 
prospects are for other mainstream media that are out there? Well, they're all too woke and they've got no audience and uh, they're going broke. And that's just what's happened. And I can't believe News Hub's lasted this long. It's been perilously close to bankruptcy for ages, even when TV3 had it. But I know plenty of people over 70 who have completely tuned out of the news and newspapers where they used to do daily. They just don't view it at all. It's just too woke. It's just a completely different product than what they want to consume. So they go elsewhere and all these sort of linear TV stations are buggered anyway because who watches pre-prescribed time television? Every, everyone I know watches on demand. Yeah, but exactly. Anyway. Um, Paul was so saying... Up, that... It's just... It's a... yeah. Sorry, you were saying? Yeah, well, oh, sorry, yeah. Well, it's just, uh, it's just a, it's a motor car revolution for the buggy carriages, right? It's just, that's all it is. Exactly. I mean, I was talking yeah. to Paul earlier... And he said, you know, I'm just sick of watching the news and being told, you know, complete rubbish and being told, you know, being gaslit effectively that um, men can have babies and can breastfeed. And uh, he said, everyone that I know um, thinks that that's uh, rubbish. And so they're not going to you know, entertain any organisation that tells us and gaslights us on completely insane stuff like, you know, safe and effective or climate change, the science is settled, or any other uh, topic that you care to mention, you can almost guarantee that the that News Hub or the, the mainstream news media in New Zealand will give an o- opposite view of what the majority of Kiwis think. Yeah, they live in way too much of a bubble. And the only people surprised that they're going broke are the journalists themselves. Tova O'Brien, yeah. you know, left TV3, started a woke TV station that was predicted to take down another opposition of yours, not even close to it, gone. You know, just, no, just, and now she's at stuff and it probably won't even last a year. So these guys, they just live in some sort of bubble. I, I just can't understand it. They, yeah, I don't to, get it. They just it's can't just, get it. It's not just Tover O'Brien. I mean, you look at um, the way Gina Lynch has carried on since the news happened, and it's like she's blaming the government because they didn't bail them out. You know, well, why didn't they just get better? Why didn't they change? Why didn't they actually represent what their viewers think instead of trying to tell us a whole bunch of rubbish and gaslight us on all sorts of issues? What you know, as I said also to um, to to another caller, you know, um, trust is something that is is valuable in a media organisation. It's something that should be nurtured and cherished and protected. And as soon as that trust is gone, and you can, you can look at trust in any sort of you know relationship, um, whether it's a customer relationship or a personal relationship, as soon as trust is gone, it's gone. It doesn't come back. It's and they they very they, hard to get back. Yeah, but by becoming the propaganda wing of the Ardern regime, everyone lost trust <laughs> in the me- in the media. I mean, you can't describe it any other way. I mean, how else can you describe it when the prime minister is standing there? Uh, telling us that she's the single source of truth, and then says, oh, okay, the first question, go to Tova, and then Jessica, and then Tova, Jessica, Jessica, Tova, backwards and forwards it went with the favourites. Why would we trust them? But I think there's a wider problem here, and it's a lot of it's to do with um, the Arden regime, where people have lost a lot of trust in our, our institutions, which used to be neutral, mutually political, you know, like the police mm. or the health workforce. You know, the national vaccine numbers are in massive decline, whereas previously they, you know, they were always getting reasonable, you know, whereas people have just completely lost trace in looking to other sources. And it's a real big problem. I mean, do you trust our judiciary? No. Do you trust our police to no. back, back you? No. Yeah, exactly. And that's a big problem. Art has done so much damage to our country. Well, when she <laughs> set up the, the um, Public Interest Journalism Fund, that just turned them all into bribed propagandists on behalf of the regime. They yeah, prescribed. Well, it came with conditions. Just yeah, exactly. It came with conditions, and the conditions were: if you didn't agree to this, you didn't subscribe to it. A, you yeah. wouldn't get the money, or B, if you changed, then we'd ask for the money back. I, I don't know how they can describe that as not a bribe. Winston's dead spot on about that. But the, the media fight him and say that he's wrong, and they might even conspire to stop reporting his comments. Did you see that? Yeah, but these are the same media who they tell us men can have babies. 
Well, it's just, yeah. So how does this pan out? How did, how... Well, I hope it pans out <laughs> in catastrophic failure and then uh, out of the ashes will come more nimble, uh, more customer-focused organisations, you know, like us at Reality Check Radio. I mean, you know, our audience numbers are growing. People like what we're um, what we're producing. Uh, they're dipping into their own pockets to fund it. We're not expecting the taxpayer to fund us. We're not applying for any government grants or anything like that for Reality Check Radio. Uh, we are surviving on the basis that we're looking after our uh, audience in many diverse ways, and that doesn't mean having you know a, a monoculture of of what we're you know, allowed to talk about. I can talk about support for Israel. Another host can talk about support for Palestine. Um, that means we're covering it, all the angles. Uh, you know, we let our guests talk. Uh, we're not interrupting them. We're not machine gunning them. You know, we're not trying to to defeat them at every opportunity. We just want to listen to what people, callers like yourself or, or others, have to say. And that's what people like. Well, I think you're definitely having some success because I noticed some comments in the mainstream media about Reality Check Radio being conspiracy radio and questioning why MPs are allowed to go on it. It's because they're obviously we're hurting them. alarmed. You're hurting we're them. And they're we're, we're taking, fighting. We're taking their audience away from them. And instead of uh, saying, well, actually, I'm losing my audience here, um, I need to change or adapt or do something like that or understand what the audience wants to hear. They sit there and wag the finger at the audience and go, don't go there. Those people are crazy. Those people are nuts. And and we're all sitting there thinking, actually, no, you you guys are the ones who are crazy. You guys are the ones who are nuts. And we're going to go and listen to Reality Check Radio because we hear both sides of the argument. You know, you've got people like, you know, Rodney Hyde and I don't see eye to eye on anything almost but we happily coexist in a, in a radio station in a media space where where all differences are welcomed. You know, Paul Brennan and I don't agree on absolutely everything. That's just the way it is. Yeah, but you shouldn't agree with everyone on everything. You know, no, otherwise you just exactly. work in a bubble, and that's what the stupid mainstream media has done to themselves, and they've just, just destroyed themselves. And they, and they're surprised at that because the bubble's so powerful. Yeah, so, and, and you know, I can I talk about what I want on my show. And, and Rodney and Paul and all the other hosts, they can talk about what they want on their show. There's no editorial um, figure wagging. There's no agreed policy position like stuff has with climate change, for instance. Um, there's none of that. <laughs> there's no woke agenda in this station, that's for sure. You know, in fact, we're anti woke. Well, keep up the good work, Cameron. It's obviously working. I, um, how do you think this plays out in a wider sense? We have an American election at the end of the year and you're potentially lining up where both sides aren't going to accept the result of the election. You know, we, we certainly, because of social media, we're certainly becoming more tribal. Yeah, the polarisation you know, is a bad thing. Side. Yeah, it is. We, we should all hate politicians of both sides. But no, we, yeah. we're getting to this position where no matter what politicians say on either side, their side will support it. And See, hate whatever the, the other side says. And I, just, I don't think that's healthy, eh? That's the greatest gift that Nikki Hager gave me. He divorced me from party politics. It made me criticise all the parties. That's why I get National Party people screaming at me that I should be supporting Luxon when I think he's an idiot. So you know, I, I think he's the David Brent of New Zealand politics. <laughs> Oh, he's trying to cuddle the soft centre. You know this. You've been around long enough. You know this. You can't not cuddle the soft centre to keep power, mate. It's just no. I think you just you should but, just cuddle common sense, and people will, will agree with you if they see someone who's doing something and it doesn't look authentic. And let me tell you, every, just about every time Christopher Luxon opens his mouth or do, does something, it's inauthentic. It's it's massaged. It's, it's he rehearsed. is genuinely an authentic politician, eh? Yeah. And it you know, shows. Like, even taking that money, which it just looks so bad. Well, you know, like, you know if that, he had two ways to play that, and he didn't play either of them. That one way is to go, oh, no, terribly sorry, um, da-da-da. He dug in, and then he reversed it, which is the worst thing you can do with vacillation. <laughs> it show, just shows weakness, you know. He was reverse ferreted by the media, and now they know if you just give him a bit of pressure, he caves. Or you could have taken my approach and yeah, say, yeah. 
stuff you, every other um, MP uh, gets uh, recompense for their accommodation, and I am too, and I don't care what you think, and that would have been the end of the story. But no, he goes well, for the soft centre. Uh, let's go and hug um, his way out of the problem, and it just made him worse, and it made him look weak. <laughs> Uh, looks it makes our mates like Seymour and Winston look good, though, doesn't it? Um, oh yeah. So. Look, Luxon was away on Tuesday um, over in Australia, and uh, and Winston Peters was was in the house, and he just tore Hipkins apart. And then uh, Marima Davidson <laughs> tried to have a go, and he just just battered that away too. I mean, you can't beat the old Silver Fox. And David Seymour's smart as well. He just needs to curb his. Um, sometimes supercilious jokes that he likes to play. But, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Um, Christopher Luxon's making David Seymour and Winston Peters uh, look like absolute geniuses. Well, is there any more genuine politicians than Winston and, and David at the moment? They both say what they believe. They're both doing exactly what they said they'd do. Is it genuinely genuine? And well, Shane Jones would be in there. Shane Jones was in there. Oh, I mean, he's an, he announced on Tuesday that he's going to um, introduce legislation to overturn the oil um, and gas ban. So you know, he's a poli- <laughs> he's a politician uh, who who just speaks his mind, and we need more politicians like that who just speak truth. And uh, and you know, it does he doesn't care whether the uh, media are upset um, by that. You know, I imagine they're all furiously tapping away on their keyboards about how terrible it is for the environment that we're going to drill for our own oil and gas instead of importing it. Well, resources provide our, you know, our wealth and our way of life. You know, we're in a big international resource market. If we give it up, you're just giving up what you have, you know. You can't have world-class health care and education and transport and, you know, so on if you don't make the wealth and we get it from natural resources, you know. So good on Shane. That's excellent news. Anyway, that's well, about my rant this week, Cameron. And, yeah, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks for calling in, Jimmy. Thank you. No holding back there. Plenty of truth bombs dropped. If only the other media would listen. I'm so blessed to have such a great bunch of mates and new buddies to share anything with, and they're so wise and speak common sense. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's Buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. That time of the show now where we get into the mailbag. Got a few comments about my Shane Jones interview from Kirsty. Great interview with Shane Jones. Keep up the good work, Cam and RCR. Anne says, hi, Cam, just listen to Shane Jones on replay. Excellent. Looking forward to him being able to rid New Zealand of more wokeness. Have a great week. And Brian adds, just listen to Cam interview with Shane Jones. Always a bloody great fan. Shane's grasp of our language and his knowledge of everything Kiwi is awesome. Just got one anonymous comment about my interview with Annie O'Brien. Just listen to Annie O'Brien's chat with Cam for the second time. She's great and have been a fan of hers for a while. Great interview, Cameron. Thank you. More please. I always try to catch your show. You're doing a great job. And we've got a couple of comments about Cam's buddies. Sarah says, hey, team, another great show this week on The Crunch. My favorite part is always the buddies. I seem to have a different favorite buddy each week. They're awesome. And, of course, Shane Jones can always be counted on to say it like he sees it. He seems like someone would be quite fun to have at the dinner table. Looking forward to the next one. Can you ask your buddies about News Hub and the state of the media in New Zealand? An anonymous comment says, I wonder what the reformed gang members who joined Man Up would suggest as a solution to the intimidating, violent and criminal gangs. Now, about uh, my interview a couple of weeks ago with Gary Moller, Trish says, Hi, Cam, thanks for sharing your hair analysis results and interpretation. I am currently waiting for my results. I found your discussion most informative and interesting, especially on what Gary said about the different minerals and the functions they provide. I commend you for your openness in your personal profile results. An anonymous comment says, amazing show, Cam and Gary Moller. I'm looking forward to hearing the next one. 
And the last comment I've got is about an interview I did with Ashley Church. It's from Bronwyn. She says, hi again, Cam. I'm listening to shows in reverse order on the one from the 15th of Feb. Now, after giving feedback on the 23rd show, I'm sorry to hear you got negative feedback on Ashley Church's talk. And I wanted to say that I found it very interesting, learned some things. And since I've been raised with a Christian worldview, it fitted my understanding of it all. I'm grateful you had him on. And that's the mailbag for this week. And that's it for the crunch this week. We've had a little bit of a history lesson from both Paul Moon and Michael Bassett. Something different, but still connected to politics. The legacy media, though, must be getting scared about Reality Check Radio. How do I know this? Well, because they're attacking us, especially stuff through Tover O'Brien and Glenn McConnell. They don't want people appearing on our shows. And as I said, they're running scared. And that means that we're doing something grand, something important, and something that they're lacking in. And we're going to keep on doing it. As usual, we'll be keeping a watching brief on US politics. This week, Donald Trump continued to win important primaries, and he's had a massive win in the Supreme Court, which struck down Democrat states' efforts to cheat by removing Trump from the ballot. The Democrats won't quit in their pathological hatred of Donald Trump, even as they steadfastly support the declining and increasingly senile Joe Biden. You can keep up with all my shows and indeed all of our shows by using the RCR app. You can even use the app to stream live. And a big thanks for the team that put together this show. Make it all work. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving all your feedback and really enjoying talking to so many people sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. So a big shout out to all of you, and thank you for listening and continuing to have faith in me as we continue to explore what I think is the beautiful game of politics. Don't forget to email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview, and let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Stay tuned for a repeat of Rodney Hyde's Real Talk coming up next, followed by a replay of Truth Speaker with Tobias Tahi. Looking forward to having you join me again next week for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.